All right. Um, but welcome everyone to the VCE Chemistry 3-4 lecture. Um, my name's Josh. Um, these slides were created by Jack um, a couple of years, uh, a couple of years ago, maybe two or three years ago now. Um, but I've been presenting it for probably the last two years, I've been updating them for the last two years. So um, as always, welcome. Um, these are supplied by ATAR Notes, which is pretty cool. Um, so ATAR Notes is, where is my charger? I did bring my laptop charger up, did I? Or maybe not. Um, ATAR Notes is a company that um, has been around for a very long time. Uh, I went to these lectures in person back when I graduated. So that is a long time ago that they're still kicking and still doing their doing their thing. There's lots of free resources. I'm sure you all know about it. You've all been here. You've all come um, to this. So you'd know all about these free resources. Um, if you've got any questions about this stuff, please feel free to ask. Um, brand new website. Um, and there's some more resources that we will talk about as we go through. Now, I reckon I left. No, I didn't my laptop charger. Um, but essentially, yes, um, feel free to ask questions as we go through. Um, there should be a Slido box below the sort of portal link to this. Um, please feel free to open that um, and ask any questions. As you'll see, the questions will start to come up over here for me. Um, if you can't get access to it through the little portal, please feel free to use this one here um, as this one here will uh, provide you with it as well. Um, so let's just get all this stuff that I don't need. Um, much better. All right, that's on the charge. Sweet. Very good. Um, so other than that, this is our plan for today. So 9.30 to 10.30, we'll go, we're going to go through thermo and equilibrio. It's going to be very quick. It's going to be very rushed. We're going to fly through a fair bit of the content today. We're not going to sort of dawdle on it. Um, I'm not going to spend heaps and heaps of time on stuff that I feel is irrelevant. I may skip over some slides. You do get access to these slides. So um, that's just kind of how it's going to go. There is lots and lots of question time. There is 10 minutes here. There's 10 minutes here and there's really five minutes here at the end. Um, so plenty of question time. There's 25 minutes of question time. And we also have two five minute breaks, um, which are going to be needed. This is a long lecture. Um, so if you do need it, make sure you get up, walk around, have a little break. Um, other than that, um, during this break here, you will notice me moving around. Uh, my housemate's in class. He's in a shoot until 10, and then I'm going to move downstairs where the internet is better. Um, and hopefully the quality will increase a little bit, but we will do that at 10. Um, and you don't have to worry. You'll be on break. Um, but my name's Josh. Um, here's a little bit about me. Um, you can feel free to read through that. Um, but essentially, um, we're here today to learn about chemistry. So nonetheless, what do you need to know? You need to know this. Um, I'm sure someone has drilled this into you already, but it's really important that you read through the study design at this point. Um, this point in the year, if you haven't read through the study design, you're probably falling a little bit behind um, and you need to make sure you are reading the study design. Why have I lost my mouse? There you go. Um, so you need to make sure that you're reading through the study design and ticking off as you go what you've learned. So I would suggest this in sort of exam study now. If you're sort of doing exams, maybe you've plateaued in your sort of improvement, which everyone does, it's normal. Maybe this time what you do is you kind of review all the content now. So you kind of go through the like your, your workbook, your summary book, you quickly flick through your textbook, whatever it is. Um, uh, or you go through the exam and you identify the questions getting wrong and then what study design dot point that is and then go back and sort of re sort of you're not going to relearn it because you already know it you're just going to review that study design dot point that you were struggling with um, I feel like that's sort of the best way to use that at this time of the year um, this is sort of the ATAR notes sort of reduced down study design so we've reduced it down into a couple of words for sort of each dot point or made it just a little bit more um, easier to follow. Um, this doesn't have nearly as much detail, and therefore I say that you still need to read this one. Um, but this is a good guide as well. If you have been through this one, now to kind of just use this as like your basic end guide. Um, but these are what you need to know essentially for your two units. I say four units, but it's two. So, fuels. Now, we're going to 
um, move fairly quickly through sort of fuels and equilibria. We're only gonna go through it in about half an hour. That's because the content isn't that heavy. Um, it's actually pretty sort of straightforward stuff. These are sort of the easier questions in the exams. It's a couple of practice questions, which I'll actually spend some time on. Um, but a lot of this stuff we're gonna move through pretty quickly. Um, so if you feel like it's going way too quick, um, please don't worry, you will get the slides um, and you will get access to this recording. These recordings do go on the uh, ATAR Notes website. So um, hopefully this is working and people have found this, by the way. Um, the questions do have to get approved by our admin. So that's probably why none of them come up on my screen yet. <clears throat> All right, so fuels. So I think what's really important here is that I talked about this um, the other day when I was doing a lecture that you break down fuels into two topics. You break it down into like fuel choices and then obtaining energy from fuels. So you've got sort of two major sides of things. Fuel choices is your rote learning. Um, it's your qualitative information. So it's your, your, um, your biofuel versus petrodiesel, sort of your biodiesel versus petrodiesel, your viscosity, all those sort of things. It's the wording. Whereas obtaining energy from fuels is the maths. This is most of this topic. Um, as much as there is a bit of rote learning and you do need to write a bit down, they love to use the maths questions in fuels, um, which come up a fair bit. So one of the really important things is um, a definition of fuel. A fuel is a substance that can be reacted with other substances leading to the release of energy that can be harnessed for a specific purpose. Important, why? Because it's specifically asked for on the study design that you know a definition of fuel. So this, this is the definition I would go with. Um, again, it's not one of those ones you need to learn word for word, but it, the wording is still important. You, you don't want to go ahead and say fuels can be combusted because lots of things can be combusted. It doesn't necessarily need to be a fuel. So really important that you sort of have a definition ready. That is a possible question in an exam. Um, and then really important, you know how to define these four concepts, renewable, non-renewable, biofuel, uh, fossil fuel. I'm sure you all know these by now, renewable. Um, it's sort of the ones that can be replenished. I like to think of renewable and non-renewable as sort of, renewable is that you can replenish it as quickly as you use it. Non-renewable is you cannot replenish it as quickly as you use it. Um, biofuels and fossil fuels, um, those ones are also um, are pretty sort of straightforward definitions that I'm sure you've been through a few times. Um, and then a few of the different ones here that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but these are the bios that you definitely need to know. So you need to know biogas. I think what's really important here is just knowing why biogas has less fuel than um, or less energy than a fossil fuel, such as coal seam gas, which is its equivalent. Um, it's because there's not as much methane. If you look at this here, you don't need to know this stat. Don't worry about the numbers here. But biogas is not 100% CH4. Um, therefore, we actually don't get as much energy out of it, even though it's the exact same sort of molecular compound as coal seam gas, because they're both CH4. So they're both a C with four H's around it. Like That's essentially what it is. And you'd think, oh, well, if I'm combusting that, I get the same amount of fuel. Well, in actual fact, in biogas, the difference is that it's not as pure. So that's the only reason there. It's a bit like, I like to think of this in compares with coal. Um, so you'll talk about sort of brown coal, black coal. Um, and then there's one other, I forgot what it is off the top of my head. Um, but we all know that black coal gives the most amount of energy because it's got the least amount of water in it. Whereas when brown coal, it's just a little bit less pure in its carbon. So therefore, there's a little bit less energy coming off it. Um, and so forth. So you get those energy levels, same thing here, it's kind of comparing like coal seam gas is the most and then biogas is the next. So bioethanol, um, this is produced by the fermentation of glucose by yeast. Um, really important that you sort of understand that, that key concept. Um, I'm sure you've all done an experiment like this in class at some point, um, but essentially you get ethanol and you get um, carbon dioxide and you put glucose with yeast. Um, it's a bit like the human body, so the human body produces lactic acid instead of ethanol, um, but same sort of concept. Um, often used for vehicle transport, you'll see it in like the E10 fuels. Cool. Biodiesel, this one's really important. You understand biodiesel. So it's produced using fats and oils, um, or animal fats really, um, in a transesterification reaction. Essentially what we do is we add a methanol. So this one has to be obtained elsewhere, but we add a methanol to our fatty acids. So we go to fatty acid and then we have our methanol added on. So this will actually be our methanol here. This will be our fatty acid here. So I'll make that look a little bit more better, a little bit cleaner for you. But essentially that there is your 
methanol. Uh, sorry, not your methanol, your fatty acid. I don't know why I said that. Too early in the morning, everyone. Um, so that's your fatty acid. And then this one here is your methanol. Um, and it's really important that you understand which parts of which, how to put them together. Now, transesterification reaction is more likely to come up in sort of your food chem. However, as I'm sure most of you have done a chemistry exam by now, they don't really split the questions up all that obviously. Sure, there'll be an, a pretty straightforward obvious fuels question. There'll be a pretty obvious equilibrium question and there'll be a pretty obvious sort of pathway slash spectroscopy question, but then everything else is sort of merged in together. And I'm sure you've all realized that by now. You go in and then everything sort of merged in together um, and little bits sort of jump off other little bits and so forth. Uh, really important that this sort of concept, as much as it's fuels, a lot of the time will actually come up in food chem and then vice versa. You have food chem parts come up in a question about this sort of stuff in fuels. So just important to sort of notice as you go through. Um, and then we have some summary slides. Um, you, I'm pretty sure you have access to slides. If you don't, they are definitely going up. Um, I know we've had some issues with just some other lectures getting them up, but they will be definitely going up. Um, here are the fuels. Um, and a little summary of them. So please feel free to have a look through them. Please do not worry about sort of learning the energy content. It's really, really not that useful. What's useful is sort of looking through here and sort of understanding the major sort of, um, the major sort of effects that it's having on both sort of the environment and the, like the sourcing and the combusting of it. Um, as it says here, VCAR does not want you to know the specific energies, which is good. And then we have here biofuels, same sort of thing. You've got the type of fuel, um, and then you've got sort of the production is actually pretty useful here. Uh, again, energy content, not as useful, but kind of knowing that like, which one is the least, which one is the most, et cetera, um, and then so forth. So advantages, disadvantages. Um, I've left this in here because I think this is a really good way to study. Um, for those of you who really struggle with sort of studying at this point, um, maybe you're going through exams and you're sort of not really feeling like you're improving or something like that. This is a really good way of studying, sort of writing out little disadvantage advantage tables um, and like comparing tables, like comparing things, maybe writing out formulas and comparing different aspects of them. It's a really good way of sort of renewing, renewable renewing, renewing your sort of knowledge of things. Um, so writing down advantages of disadvantages of fossil fuels, advantages, disadvantages of biofuels. Um, again, I think this stuff's pretty straightforward for all of you. Advantage renewable is the first thing you're going to say. Um, advantage relatively carbon neutral. Now, for those of you who are wondering what is carbon neutral, um, it's a concept that you probably need to know how to define. Um, apologies. It's obviously spring again. I'm getting all my hay fever again, but nonetheless. Um, carbon neutral. So carbon neutral is essentially where um, the amount of carbon absorbed through the growth of the plant or the animal that is used to create the fossil fuel. Oh no, create the fossil, sorry, create the biofuel. Um, is this relatively the same amount that is then produced in combusting it. So think about it as we don't want to produce lots of carbon dioxide when we sort of combust things, but we do. That's that's the reality. But if we can offset that with how much we absorb when we make it, therefore, we've got a good balance. And having that good balance will allow us to essentially um, be carbon neutral. Um, so yeah, there's another one there. And then this is the other one that's really important. You need to know how to compare biodiesels and petrodiesels. So how they're produced um, and what is their bonding? Sort of, this is where year 11 content comes in, intramolecular versus intermolecular. So remember that your intermolecular is like, think of it like intranet is within a company. Internet is between different companies. So intermolecular bonds can be between different molecules. Think about the bonding there, like what bonding is forming there? What are we, what is connecting? Um, usually with biodiesels, we think more dipole dipole, but there's also a little bit of um, hydrogen bonding because we have those oxygens in there. Um, and so therefore it's more viscous. It has a higher cloud point and it clogs the lines a lot easier, so forth. <laughs> So there's a little comparison table. This is another really good one for your summary. Um, I would essentially try and produce this yourself without reading through this. So I would maybe um, get your headings, get all the headings and then have a go at writing all this information in without looking at this. Um, so have a go at it, use it as a little revision tool, make it like, it's like, it's like doing flashcards, but you're writing it down. Um, and once you've written it all down and you think you've got it all, 
then have a look at this and compare it and sort of finish it off. Nice little revision thing. Um, so there's a quick little practice question here that I think is, um, I think it's a good one. Um, and it isn't a particularly a hard question. However, it's a question that's answered really poorly. So I'm going to give everyone like 30 seconds to a minute. Um, I don't want you to to rush through this if you if you don't have enough time, don't worry. But have a quick go at this. Um, describe one environment, one environmental advantage of using biodiesel as a fuel rather than petrodiesel, um, which is produced from crude oil. Have a quick go at this. I think what's really important to note before you start is this. Um, so it's not a difficult question, but this is a question that was answered very, very poorly. <laughs> All right, hope they're giving enough time. I think I've given everyone enough time. So this one here, um, I think what's really, really important about this question is they're asking for a comparison in a sense. One environmental advantage of using biodiesel as a fuel rather than petrodiesel. So what we need to say is biodiesel does something which is advantageous when in comparison to what petrodiesel does. And that's what's really, really important. It's only asking for one, but this comparison like this part of it, this is where the second mark comes from. So this advantage is sort of the first mark. This comparison is the second mark. And it's really, really important that you have both those aspects. So um, you could say something such as, um, uh, I think a really common one that people used um, is that the production of biodiesel um, is less harmful on the environment when in comparison to petrodiesel as petrodiesel may, um, in most cases, is produced from crude oil, which is obtained via drilling through marine life and ocean, and there's a high risk of spillage, um, whereas biodiesel does not utilize this technique. So writing something such as that. So as you can see here in the answers, it asks for two marks, an environmental advantage of biodiesel. So as you said, the production of biodiesel, which is via transesterification reactions, um, does not have a harmful impact on the environment. Therefore, in comparison to our petrodiesel, you then give the disadvantage in a sense. As much as it hasn't asked for the disadvantage, it's only asked for the advantage, it's two marks. And it's really important you understand that. When you are answering exam questions, this is my biggest tip, as you go, th go through, before you even think about moving on from a question, look at the number of marks, and tell yourself, have you answered the number of marks that are there? Was there two marks there that you wrote down? Or did you just write down one mark? So really important, that's what you look at. All right, now, moving on. Um, universal gas equation, or what I like to refer to as the Pevenet, um equation. That's how my teacher taught it to me, and that's how I remember it. Really important about this is just knowing your different... Um, your different uh, units. So as long as you know the units, you'll be all over it. Universal gas equation, you always, you just get given that. So don't worry about that. But you need to know the amount of gas in moles, the liters, the kilopascals, and the temperature. And you really need to know how to convert to all of those from the other, the other ones that you get given, like mass, atmospheres, mils, uh, degrees Celsius, etc. Really important you know all that information and therefore you then input it. Um, also really important that you understand this equation here, which is the SLC equation, um, where when this is at SLC, if we think about it, we're going to be at a consistent pressure. We're going to be at a consistent temperature and likely that we'll probably be at a consistent volume. Uh, no, not volume, sorry. Uh, no, we won't be at anything else. 
these are going to be the these are going to be the outliers. Sorry, these are the ones that are different. This one is a number. This one is a number, and this one is a number. So therefore, you can do all the multiplication and and division and whatever for these three, and therefore you can pretty much remove these three from the equation with one number, and therefore you're only left with these here, and we call this number twenty four point eight. And how do we use that? Well, we refer to this as VM and we use this formula here. So you're left with moles, volume, and then the VM. And this is in the data booklet. It's really important. You will find this in the data booklet. If you forget what the number is, 24.8, it is in the data booklet. Um, and then enthalpy of change. So really important that we understand enthalpy of change. Um, so delta H means energy change. Delta H requires a sign. Um, Really important that you just understand sort of your basic exothermic and endothermic equations with this. I'm not going to go through too much detail on this. This isn't a great sort of picture. It's one made on PowerPoint, but remember, it's going to look something like this. Remember that this is your activation energy, and then this is your enthalpy of change. So really important um, that you understand your different sort of aspects of that. Same thing for endothermic. You really need to know this one as well. So endothermic works in sort of the opposite way where you go all the way up. And then you come down. And again, this here is the enthalpy change. This here is the activation energy. So really important you know how to draw those out and you know how to produce them. Now, endothermic, positive, exothermic, negative. Um, so really important when you write out a thermochemical equation, you put this on there. It's important that if you are asked to write an equation, you do not put this on here unless you are asked to write out a thermochemical equation. It needs to be explicitly said in the question, otherwise there is no point in doing it. Um, easy, and also notice here that this has got two moles at the front, and so therefore this has been this number here has been doubled as a total. Um, also really important is that you know how to sort of manipulate these. Um, so as you can see here, um, you multiply coefficients, um, you also multiply the delta H. So as you can see here, I've doubled everything. So double this to this, therefore I'm gonna double this to this. If I reverse it, then I just reverse the sign from positive to negative. So as you can see here, this ended up on this side. So if you reverse it, go from positive to negative. And also really important that when you add sort of two equations together, you just add together the, the, um, the delta H's. So negatives and positives, you just add them together. Um, as you can see here, when you add a negative to a positive, it gets taken away, obviously. Well, it gets technically added, but the number as a sense gets, takes, gets taken away. Um, so really important, um, there's another aspect here as well that is stated, um, and I don't teach it all that often, but I have put it, left it in here um, because I feel like it's important. It has come up before. Understanding that delta H versus delta HC. Now, this is just a very mild thing. This will always be given on a thermochemical equation. You write out a thermochemical equation, you give this. If you are unsure, you give this. This is per mole of reaction. Essentially, it's like, um, Obviously, you're still going to give it with kilojoules per mole or so forth, but it's essentially saying if I have one mole of this entire reaction, so one mole of this entire reaction, I'm going to have that produced. Whereas delta HC acts as like what is in your data booklet, because as you can see in your data booklet, you have this, you have heat of combustion in kilojoules per gram, you have heat of combustion in kilojoules per mole. This is essentially saying Notice how there's no signs on this. These are all positive because it's saying per mole of the fuel. It's not talking about the reaction. It's talking about the fuel itself. So this will only be given if you are asked to find the heat of combustion of a fuel, of a particular fuel, not a reaction of a fuel. Um, so this is always in thermochemicals. It needs a sign. This one here is if you're finding one of a fuel. So if maybe you're doing like an experiment and finding a theoretical value. Um, and then lastly, one other equa uh, equation, Q equals MC delta T. I'm not going to dawdle on that one. I'm sure you all know what it is. Just remember to use your right sort of specific heat capacity. Um, usually you're given it in the question. Otherwise, water is in the data booklet. All right. Rates and equilibria. Now, I'm going to fly through this one in like 10 or 15 minutes. This one does not need too much time. Um, but essentially, once again, can be broken up into two aspects. You have reaction rates and you have equilibria. Um, so reaction rates are essentially how quickly something occurs, equilibria is like your yield, and it's like your irreversible versus reversible. It's your K values, it's your dynamic equilibrium. This is where most of the content is. This is where sort of the collision theory is, and you do need to know collision theory. Um, so collision theory, um, it's just saying that chemical reactions result as collisions between molecules. 
So what's really important is there's two aspects to it. It needs to have sufficient energy. So it needs to be sufficiently energetic. So it has to have enough energy and they must care in the correct orientation. So sufficient energy refers to activation energy. It just needs to have more energy than the activation energy. We know this. Secondly, correct orientation. Things need to bump into each other the right way. Um, think of it like Lego bricks. You can't put the back of Lego bricks together. You can't put the front of Lego bricks together. It doesn't work like that. You need to have them in the right orientation for them to connect um, and then to form something. Therefore, that is collision theory in a sense. Um, and then from there, we can then talk about how do we make our reactions faster? Well, we understand that collision theory told us that we need to have more we need to have more collisions. So we need to have more of these collisions occurring and we need to have these collisions occurring with enough energy for it to actually occur. So if we have more collisions occurring, we call this collision frequency. And if we want more of those successful ones, like we want them to be hitting with the enough, or with the enough, with enough um, activation energy, we call this a proportion of successful collisions. Now, there are three ways to increase collision frequency, temperature, um, having a high pressure or concentration and having a higher surface area. So this essentially just provides more places for things to bump into each other. Um, and the method two is increase the proportion of successful collisions. Well, in te temperature is there again. So this is the one that fits in both and then a catalyst. Um, so a catalyst will bring everything down. Um, so as you can see here, this slide just essentially gives a summary of each of the first three methods. So you increase the temperature, you know, fast moving particles, more collisions, um, increase concentration while well, there's going to be more particles. There's more people in a train. You're going to bump into more people. Think about it. You go to a Collingwood Carlton match and you take the train, the Metro train afterwards, you're going to be bumping into each other. You go to a St. Kilda doggies match. Um, the train afterwards is going to have like 10 people in there. Maybe St. Kilda North would have been a better one, but you know what I mean? Um, higher concentration of people, more pressure within the, within like the space, you're going to have more frequency of collisions. Um, and then increased service area, same sort of thing. You're going to have more people for bumping. Um, and then rates of a reaction. So increasing the temperature, the first thing is the temperature doesn't affect the activation energy. It just increases the number of particles that have more energy than the activation energy, more energy than activation energy the equation occurs, the reaction occurs, cool. Catalyst on the other hand, doesn't increase the number, the amount of energy within the system. It just lowers the activation energy and therefore there are more particles that now have more energy than the activation energy, even though there's been no change in the overall energy. What's really important about that is this. It provides an alternative reaction pathway. If you are asked to describe a catalyst and how it works, you're not gonna say that it lowers the activation energy and that's just about it you are going to say that what it does is it provides an alternative reaction pathway and therefore allows for more molecules to have sufficient energy within the reaction. So essentially you're saying that it's providing an alternative pathway to get there. So I like to think of it as this. This was the original pathway. This had lots and lots of activation energy. It wasn't very useful. This is the new pathway. Doesn't need nearly as much, a lot less, much better. So think of it like that. Although we arrive at the same place, we start at the same place, we just take a different path. It's like taking a different road. It's like taking the freeway compared to the highway. The freeway's at 110, the highway's at 100. You're gonna get there quicker um, and more people are gonna get there on the, on the freeway in a set amount of time. Um, and then Maxwell-Boltzmann curves, really important you understand these. These are things that sort of, I feel like I neglected a little bit. Um, it's funny that you can teach them through a meme um, and this has been there for like three years and I'm just never going to update it because it's actually a really good diagram. If you're going to increase the temperature of a maxwell Boltzmann curve, this is what's going to occur. What does that mean? It means that the whole curve is going to flatten and sort of spread further forward. Think of it like that. It spreads further forward and it flattens. The area under this versus the area under this is the exact same. The activation energy is in the exact same spot. It's always going to be just here. It's not going to move. Um, essentially, all that's happened is that because the curve is sort of flattened and gone forward, you have more that more area under the graph or more molecules in total that are above that activation energy. Because the area here is smaller than the area of this one here, which is much larger. Same thing over here, except 
it's a little bit different how it changes. This one, the graph itself doesn't change, the activation energy does. And this is for the use of a catalyst. So the activation energy goes backwards. And that's how we get that one to work there. So rates of reaction versus extent of the reaction. So rate of reaction is how fast the reaction occurs. It's what we've just been through. We're now gonna go into extent, which is more about equilibrium stuff. Uh, so what's really important here is understanding a dynamic equilibrium. I'm sure you've all heard it before, but if you haven't, it's another thing you need to know how to define, not explicitly said in the study design, but you do need to know how to define it. It just comes up and they expect you to define it. Essentially dynamic equilibrium is where um, a system reaches equilibrium and to the naked eye, it appears like nothing is occurring because there's no more change occurring. However, um, if you look at it on a molecular level, the forward and the reverse reactions are still occurring. They're just occurring at the same rate to which it looks like there is no change. Um, What's really important is when you talk about rate, when you reach equilibrium, they're gonna be at equal rates. Whereas when you talk about amount, they don't need to be at the same amount. This is how you defer which graph is which. Um, also equilibrium constants. I think equilibrium constants are probably the most important part of this, all of this. Why are equilibrium constants important? Because people always get them wrong in exams. Really important products on top of reactants. And this is the formula. What's also really important about K values is the only thing that changes a K value for a reaction is the temperature. So if you change the temperature of a reaction, it's gonna change the K value. If you keep the temperature constant and you just change the amounts, it's not gonna change the K value. It's always gonna reach the same equilibrium K value. So that's also one really important point. Um, really important that you understand which way a K value will go if you heat or cool an equation. So if this is an exothermic equation, so we're gonna call this an exothermic equation because it's got a negative. I like to say that this side is the hot side. That's a terrible H, apologies. And I like to say this is the cold side. Now, what I, why I say that is because if I heat this equation up, this equation will wanna cool itself down. So which way is it gonna go? It's gonna to go towards the cool side. So by going towards the cool side, it's going to increase the number of reactants. And it's going to reduce the number of products. Therefore, overall, it's going to reduce K. If it was the other way around, we cool the equation, we want to heat it up, we'd go to the hot side, we'd increase the number of products, reduce the reactants, increase the K value. One way of thinking about it as well. Um, so as you can see there, uh, in general, that's a good way of thinking about it. Good little summary slide there, I do like that one. Um, and then also really important, you know how to manipulate a K value. So therefore, if the K value changes or the equation changes, you know how to manipulate it. I'm just going to leave these slides up. You can have a look at them. Um, as I said, you will get it, access to these, but don't worry too much. And then also what's really important with this is understanding the Q value. Um, now, the Q value is the reactant quotient. Um, it's calculated the same as K. It gives a, a relationship between the amount of reactant and the amount of product at a given time. What's really important is that the Q value is essentially K, but just when it's not at equilibrium. If you get to equilibrium, it's no longer a Q value, it's a K value. Um, what's also really important is understanding which way we shift. If we shift to the left or the right. Now think about it. If the Q, uh, well, didn't mean to do that. Apologies, everyone. Now, if the, is that going to fix itself up or is it, why has it gone like that? Um, give me a second. Much better. Apologies. Now, if the Q value is greater than K, essentially what you're thinking is that the products in Q are greater than the products in K, and therefore the reaction needs to go backwards, it needs to go back towards the reactants to get what we want out of it. So essentially that's what needs to happen from here. Also, I don't know why this is completely gone skew with and it's gone a weird size, but we will fix this in the break. Um, so essentially that's essentially what happens there. If Q equals K, there's no change. That's, it's important to understand that that is now a K value. It's no longer a Q value. Um, so we have a practice question here. Now, um, this is a really, really good practice question. I'm gonna leave this one up. If we have time at the end, we're coming back to this practice question. Um, because this is a really good practice question that students always really struggle with. So we will come back to that one if we have time. Um, now, Le Chatier's principle, one of those things you need to know as well. So you need to know how to um, solve, how to, sorry, 
sort of apply Le Chatier's principle, but you also really need to know how to just say Le Chatier's principle and be like, hey, this is Le Chatier's principle um, and put it out there on a screen. Um, if a system is um, in equilibrium, is subject to change, the system will spawn partially opposed to change. Important you know that. Um, awesome. Also, there's rice tables or ice tables, whichever way you like to, to put them out there. Um, I generally use ice tables, not rice tables, but they're exactly the same. It's just you put the letters at the top. Awesome. Um, there are some practice questions here. Please feel free to go through it. Um, so we're about two minutes over, but that's okay. We also have that multiple choice question I want to go back to. So we're a couple minutes over, but that's okay. Um, quickly, before I start answering some questions, um, just a few little, uh, how do I describe it? A few little uh, promos. So essentially the first one here, really important. Um, I work for a company called ChewSmart that is owned by ATAR Notes, which is why I'm here today. Now at ChewSmart, we sort of tutor um, and we do weekly classes. So um, every week I have a class, goes for an hour and a half. Those students sort of get my email, they can ask me questions via email. Um, when I do respond, I'm a little bit of a slow responder. Um, but essentially there are slides, there are worksheets every week. At the moment we're going through practice exams that we've created. So there's practice like exams that are exclusive to sort of shoot smart. Essentially, the recordings go up every week, but what you'll get if you sort of do it now, so usually you pay like a weekly fee, what you'll do now is if you pay sort of that value there, you get access to all your classes and you get access to all of the year's content. You get access to all of the, um, the recordings, all of the worksheets, all of the exams, all of the content that's up. Um, so you'll get access to all of that right now if you sort of sign up now. Uh, but that's sort of one thing there. Um, you can have a look at that online at choosemart.com slash exam pass. We also have a one-on-one tutoring. Um, I love that that's the back of Seth's head. Seth's one of our um, uh, methods tutors. I love Seth. Seth's great. Um, but nonetheless, um, I don't actually offer one-on-one tutoring. This box is meant to be my times that I'm available and the subjects I offer. Um, I don't actually offer one-on-one tutoring, unfortunately. Um, being a medical student, I don't really have enough time to do that outside of sort of classes. Um, but there are lots of really good chemistry tutors, ones that are far smarter than me, um, that are worth going and having a chat to. So 100%, if you have time, and this is something you're really interested in, you can book an info call. Um, and Davey, who sort of runs the program, is my manager, is awesome. He'll get in touch with you um, and sort of chat you through what it is um, and all that sort of stuff. So definitely worth a shout. Um, now, Quick question time. We're going to take five minutes. We'll do some questions and then we will jump into um, what is next. Um, now, I'm sure have you sort of all seen in the box that you can approve sort of questions that are at the top. Please feel free to go through and do that um, if you want to. Um, so just here, first question. Did your SAC scores give you a good indication on what your study score was going to end up being? Um, I think it's a really good question, but at the same time, I think it's one of those questions. Um, I personally think, and this is something I speak with most of my sort of chem students, is that um, SAC scores are a bit of an interesting one. I wouldn't spend too much time worrying about SAC scores. SAC scores are one of those things where it's kind of like, um, it's one of those things where SACs, like SAC scores, are interesting because my sacks at my school could have been a lot easier than your sacks at your school. Um, and therefore it's not a great indicator of, of how you're going because sacks can be very, very manipulative. Essentially how sack scores work is that they give you a rank and that is it. And then the exam is essentially where you sort of sit amongst everyone else and they kind of compare the ranks and they kind of fit you in somewhere and they get you a score. There's big complex calculations. I don't really understand how it fully works, but it just depends. Um, for example, um, in one of my subjects, bio, um, so I end up getting a 45 in bio, um, all of my sacks I was getting high 90s on because they were fairly straightforward sacks. They were not particularly difficult sacks. Whereas chemistry, obviously I only got one less in my study score and it scales up significantly more than bio, um, scales up three or four. Um, essentially, if you think about it in that sort of sense, um, I did probably better in chemistry overall than I did in bio, but I didn't get nearly as good SAC scores uh, because my SACs were significantly harder in chemistry. So I don't think they're a great indicator. Um, I wouldn't be 
sweating on them. I wouldn't be sitting there putting them into a calculator and going, all right, I'm, I'm going to get a 42 because I've been getting this in my sacks. Um, I'm going to get like a 31 because I've been getting these in my sacks. I wouldn't worry about that as much. Um, that's, I don't think they're a great indicator of how that sort of stuff works. Um, but it's a good question. Um, I wouldn't stress too much on sacks, um, if that sort of makes sense. Um, is EA an approved acronym? Um, interesting question. I'm not sure. Um, I essentially write mine like this. This is how I put mine. Activation energy. Um, I like to do a E to the little A. E is definitely an approved acronym because it's energy and they love to use that. E to the A I think is fine. Um, I don't see any issue with it. So I would happily use it, but make sure you use little capital A at the bottom like that. Um, I think it's a fine acronym to use. And a lot of the time, as long as you say what it is, so you go like activation energy, is and then you put in brackets like a to the e and you've done that at some point then you're fine um, for sort of using that from then on um what we say has a lot because the carbon is partial that is that is to the degree tr uh, true but it's also partly because of the sort of um impurity so one of the easier way of thinking about brown coal so brown coal is an interesting one because yes it does partially oxidize but a really easy way of thinking about brown coal is this um, if you've got like, this is, I don't know, this is coal. I'm sure coal doesn't look anything like this, but I'm just going to draw a coal like this. If this is coal, um, and so we have black coal versus brown coal. So I'm going to put black coal on this side. So this is black coal and this is brown coal. If we think of it like this, essentially what happens in brown coal is there's lots of water sort of sifted it's not in between, but there's water sort of floating within the molecule. Essentially, what happens when you combust this or when you, you smash it open and you burn it up, essentially what's happening is the energy that's coming out of this that's meant to be heating up whatever it's meant to be heating up. Um, say, in I think in the case of actual electricity, they have like a sort of, they put the fuel underneath. They have like a, it's like a big system, but essentially you've got a big like lattice of water here. Um, and it's not just water, it's got a few other things in there. So it steams really easily and the steam goes up and then it produces a turbine and the turbine spins. That's a turbine, it's a terrible turbine. And the turbine spins and then that produces electrical energy which goes out in their wires. Um, terrible little diagram I've drawn there. But essentially, if we think of it like that, um, when you are heating up and when you're combusting this carbon or this brown coal, part of the heat energy that's produced should all be going into here, it should all be going into here. However, if there is water in here, part of that energy goes straight into this water to turn this into steam. Part of this energy from this bond goes straight into this water to heat up this and make that into steam. Now this steam is no longer, is not in the lattice, so it's not really useful. Um, it's not really getting used within our system. <coughs> Essentially, this heat that is being wasted on this water is losing the amount of energy that you get out of this brown coal. Uh, so essentially, there's actually the same amount of energy. If you have the same amount of brown coal, well, a little bit less because of the weight distributions. But if we had the same mass of carbons as we in brown as we did in black. There's the same amount of energy there. The problem is that the energy coming out of the brown coal is going into that water and it's not actually going into this sort of lattice here and going into the system. Black coal, on the other hand, doesn't really have as many of these waters in there. It's much more refined. Um, it's been in the ground for a lot longer. It's able to really just be carbons at this point. And therefore, we get a much better sort of response. Uh, is that, I'm hoping that sort of makes sense in regards to that question there. Um, all right. Well, that's enough time for this question time. We have another 15 minutes of questions. Please feel free to ask anything you have and upvote the questions that you want answered as well. So uh, if there's something that, um, if there's a question there that you also want answered, just give it a tick. So give it a little, give it a little like. And essentially what that'll do is it'll push it to the top and I'll see it first. Now, essentially, we're going to make a move downstairs, take five minutes, take a little break. We're going to start back at 10.21 um, and um, I'll be in a different position. You will, it's not, this stream isn't going to end. You're going to see me walking downstairs, um, but uh, feel free to sort of, um, feel free to go take a quick break, um, five minutes and then we will reconvene.
all right. I reckon we have given it enough time. I reckon we can jump back into it now. Um, so, essentially, um, that was everything for the first part. We're now going to jump into Electrochem and... Uh, Electrochem and then sort of reactions and a little bit of spectroscopy. Now, there are spectroscopy slides. If we run out of time, um, I'm not too stressed in skipping them um, because I'd rather um, spend a little bit of time at the end going through sort of exam advice, how to attack sort of exam questions, how to approach all that side of things. Um, so essentially, we are now at the 10, 20 time frame. We have sort of 15 minutes to get through all of this content. So there is plenty of content, um, but there is plenty of time. So let's push on. So, Redox Basics, I'm sure you all know this stuff pretty well by now, um, but the acronym Oil Rig, if you don't know it, here it is. Um, oxidation involves loss, reduction involves gain. So, oxidation involves loss, reduction involves gain. Now, what that means is that oxidation, you, you lose electrons out of whatever molecule you're working with. This electron loses these electrons here. On the other side, reduction, same thing. Reduction involves gain. So it's gaining electrons here. The electrons are gained into this molecule over here. So electrons on the right versus electrons on the left is kind of how I like to think about it as well. Um, in a redox reaction, I'll leave that down so it's not covering that. In a redox reaction, one species is the oxidant and the other species is the reductant. So terminology matters. And this is where things get really, really confusing. So the oxidant causes oxidation of the reductant and is itself reduced. So what's really important is when I call something an oxidant, it is not going through oxidation. This is where people get really confused. It's actually causing oxidation to occur. So the I'm going to say teacher, but I'm going to use the word educator because educator is a better way of thinking about it. The educator, which is your teacher, it's the person who comes and teaches you chemistry. They're an educator. They educate you, so you become educated. They themselves do not educate themselves, but you become educated. Really, that's kind of a good way of thinking about it. So the educator, which is the teacher, is going to get you to be educated, but you aren't itself, not you, like the teacher itself is not going to be educated themselves. Same thing for an oxidant. The oxidant is gonna cause the other species that's within the reaction to go through oxidation, but it itself is not going to be oxidized. It's actually going to be reduced because the other species is going to be a reductant and the reductant is going to cause that original species to go through reduction, but it itself is oxidized by that other species being an oxidant. So think about it in that sense there that it itself, what its name is, is what it's causing others to do. So an entertainer, itself isn't entertained, it entertains everyone else. Everyone else is entertained when they're around the entertainer. So another way you can think about it is teacher does teaching, um, just like oxidant does oxidizing. Cool. Um, oxidation states, uh, very appropriate meme. This meme has been here for like three years and yet it's still so appropriate. It's even more appropriate now than it ever has been. Um, but essentially oxidation states. So this is the backbones of chemistry when we talk about redox. So how can we determine which reaction is redox? We need to look at oxidation states. So we'll come back to that in a second. Oxidation states can be pretty straightforward. You just need to know sort of the, the three major rules. First rule, free elements are always zero. So oxygen, O2, is gonna be zero. Um, a solid metal like zinc, um, or in this case here they've used sodium, is gonna be zero. Chlorine gas, going to be zero. Two, oxidation states, states of simple ions are equal to the charge. So Cl minus and negative one, Mg2 plus is two plus and so forth. And then three, in compounds, this is kind of like, there's kind of actually like five rules, um, but essentially it's fine. In compounds, main group metals have oxidation states equal to the charge of their ions. So Na, Mg, so the middle, the thing at the front, well generally it's at the front, is going to be um, sort of, it's going to keep its charge. Hydrogen is always plus one. 
and oxygen is always negative two. Now, there is one case where oxygen is not always negative two, and I usually get people put their hand up on room person and say, which one is that? It is hydrogen peroxide. Now, I know there's more examples. There are multiple examples there. I think there's like five or six things. I'm not 100% I'm not sure, but there's a few things where oxygen is not negative two. However, for the sake of VCE chemistry, really important, and this is a tip that goes around to everyone. Do not learn outside the scope of VCE chemistry. VCE chemistry does change a few things to make it doable within a year, um, to make it make sense at a year 12 level. Please do not go and try and learn things outside of the scope of that because then you'll find that some things that are taught are actually like slightly wrong in the context of, of real life, but for chemistry, three, four, they're not. So really important. But essentially what you'll find is that um, oxygen is always negative two unless it's hydrogen peroxide for chemistry because in VC chemistry, this is the only example that's ever come up in an exam where oxygen was not negative two. It's the only one that they kind of explicitly want you to know and it's hydrogen peroxide. Now in this case here, these are plus ones and these are negative ones. So you end up having two plus ones and two negative ones. Hydrogen peroxide, um, if, you haven't, if you're wondering where you've heard it before, it's a deadly um, sort of, uh, it's a deadly, I'd say it's a gas, it's more of a liquid, it's the capsules. Um, so a lot of the spies during World War II would have the capsules put in their, they'd actually have one of their two teeth pulled out and they'd put a capsule and a fake tooth there um, and it would sit sort of lower so that you wouldn't, when you're eating your food, it's not going to crack. Um, but essentially, if you bit a certain way, you could crack it open and essentially it would really release um, hydrogen peroxide um, into your body. That's one of those things. Um, so um, there was actually another molecule they used as well. So there was two types, but hydrogen peroxide was one of them. So it was a deadly molecule. Essentially, that is hydrogen peroxide. Um, some of all oxidation states uh, must equal the charge on the species. This is where you do those simple little those maths equations. Cool. So if we look at these ones here, which of these is your redox equation? Well, which one changes? Which one has changing oxidation states? Well, three is the only one. Zero to plus three and zero to negative one. They're the only ones that change. So therefore, not redox, not redox, redox. So we only have one here that's redox. It's really important you understand your oxidation states to understand which is redox and which isn't. Um, if the oxidation state reduces um, then the species has been reduced. Cl goes from zero to negative one, so therefore it reduces. Um, if the oxidation state increases, then that species was oxidized. Awesome. Um, ha so how do we actually figure out um, half equations though? So half equations are then the next step on from oxidation states. Um, and to figure out a half equation, what you'll be given is you go into a question and they'll give you a, um, they'll say, They'll give you two molecules. I'm like, this is the starting species. This is the end species. How do I get from this to this with a half equation? You're going to use the Coase method. Now, before we start this as well, I think it's really important as well is half equations are, it's really important that when we talk about half equations, they are theoretical. Half equations don't occur in isolation in real life. Um, so redox will only occur if you've got both oxidation and reduction. And that's a really important concept to get your head around. If you don't have oxidation, you've just got reduction, like you've got a reduction half equation, not gonna happen in real life. You have to have both occurring. So therefore half equations don't actually occur in real life, only full equations. We are just theoretically thinking about what actually sort of happens if we break it down. Now, therefore this doesn't happen like in isolation, as I've said, but they do happen as a combination in a full sort of equation. But it's kind of our way of sort of breaking it down and having looking at it, looking at it from it's sort of like, how does this actually occur? What is sort of the chemistry behind it? So it's a kind of important point. But nonetheless, Coase method. So the Coase method um, is this one here. So essentially, if you're given two molecules and you need to create a half equation or half sort of a balance, you have to balance out a half equation or create a half equation. You need to go through this method. So first of all, you're gonna balance the key atoms. So this is all the atoms except for hydrogens and oxygen. So if you're given, um, maybe if you're given sort of that penanginate, uh, I can never say it properly, penanginate. So you get the MnO4 and then you get the Mn. So you get like Mn, oh, that's terrible. What is that? 
You never say it properly. Um, MN2 plus, and you got MN, it's like MNO, whatever it is, two negative or whatever, whatever that it is. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. But essentially, you need to go from that to that. You're not going to balance the oxygens at the start. You're just going to balance the MNs. That's all you're going to balance at the start. That is what key atoms are. Um, you then are going to go to um, the oxygens next, and you don't balance those by putting numbers. You balance those by adding waters to either side. So if you've got um, oxygens on the left and you need to balance out those oxygens to the right, you're going to add waters to the right to balance it out. You then have, will probably have too many hydrogens because undoubtedly you've added hydrogens to the right. You may have had none on the left or you may have only had a couple. You now have too many hydrogens on the right. You're going to go and add hydrogen ions to the left. Cool. You've now balanced out all your atoms, but by adding hydrogen ions, you now have a charge imbalance. So you've got a positive charge on the left, but no charge on the right. You then need to add electrons to balance out that charge on the right. So that's your last step. And then oh well, your, your second last step, your last step is then to add states and make sure you've got all the states in there. You've got that all right. Um, electrons don't have a state, really important. You don't put a state on electrons. Now, Important about this is that hydrogen ions, they cause acidity. This is an acidic environment. So therefore, if I'm asked to create a half equation, but I'm in a basic or alkaline environment, I therefore need to do an extra step to change this up. So same method, however, we add an extra H in. This H is adding OH ions to either side. So what this means is that Let's say we had, as before, we had like two H2Os on this side, therefore we added four H pluses to this side. And we've got, I don't know, X and we have, let's just say, call this XO and we have X. That's what we've got. Or maybe this is XO2 because that's how I got it. So that's my equation. Essentially, what is going to happen here is I need to make this basic. And to make this basic, I need to get rid of these H pluses. Now, the only way to get rid of these H pluses is to add OH minus. So I'm going to add four of these. Now, why am I going to add four of these? Because if I add four OH minuses, I'm going to make this four H2Os. When I have four H2Os, I'm going to cancel that out, make this two, and I'm going to cancel out all those H2Os. But importantly, I added OH minus to this side. I therefore need to add four OH minus to this side. So I'm going to have leftover OH minuses, but that's okay. It's just like having leftover hydrogen pluses on this side. I now have leftover OH minuses on this side. Uh, that's what makes it alkaline. Now, what's really important is that in an exam question, if it doesn't explicitly tell you if it's a basic environment or an acidic environment, you assume it is acidic. First up, assume acidic unless, which is this one, which is this method here, unless you are told it is basic alkaline or there is a hint to it in the question, have a look at the question. If they talk about hydrogen ions or they talk about a low pH, it's going to be acidic. If they talk about it being, maybe they'll use an indicator and they'll tell you that the indicator is at this, like it's at a pH of 10. Well, that's going to be a basic environment, isn't it? So, you need to be able to sort of unpack and use a little bit of um, sort of um, decision making and sort of detective work just to check that it doesn't actually mention it explicitly anyway. Now, it's actually quite likely they just won't mention anything, but it's also as likely that they'll mention something and just keep it quite hidden. So really important, you know that if there is nothing there, it is acidic. If there is, then you go with what it's sort of indicating. Um, and so moving on from that, we move on to galvanic cells. Now, galvanic cells are in everything. They're in your laptop, they're in your phone. Really important, you know how to sort of label out a galvanic cell. This is how I would draw out a galvanic cell. I think this is the best way to do it. Um, what's really important is you label each electrode, you label the electrolyte, you label the internal circuit. Um, make sure you have a suitable um, salt bridge uh, molecule like a KOH or whatever you're going to use. Just make sure it is suitable, whichever one you are using. Um, or KNO3, I think, is one of the ones that people use. Is it KNO3? 
That's a really common one, Kano3. Um, that's, there's a few different ones that are acceptable, um, but that's usually the one that I think a lot of people use. Um, and then really important that this one here doesn't label it because there's no anode and cathode, but you need to label which way the electrons go. So are they going left to right, right to left? You just need to make sure you put all that stuff in there. Now, a good way of remembering which one is the anode and which one is the cathode is with an extension of our formula. So an oil rig cap. So the vowels, anode and oxidation go together. The consonants R and C, reduction and cathode go together. Now, another way of also then further remembering, cats are usually happy. So therefore, the cat is going to be the positive electrode. The anode is going to be the negative electrode. Now, this is only during galvanic processes, really important. This is during a galvanic process, which is a discharge. So we're discharging our energy. This is not recharge, this is discharge. So really important, we have a happy cat and therefore reduction occurs at the cathode and an oxidation occurs at the um, anode. Now, further to this, is a really important point that I feel like a lot of people miss as well. Um, the anode and oxidation, oxidation, where oxidation occurs becomes the anode. And I think that's what's really important here. We don't put something down. So I don't put, I'm going to use my phone. I will use this pen as an example. I don't put this down as my electrode and I go, that is my anode. That's incorrect. I put this down and say, I want this to be an electrode and I want this to be my anode. But until oxidation starts occurring at this site, it is not an anode. What if reduction starts occurring at this site? Well, this becomes a cathode. But then I flip things around and, and uh, oxidation starts occurring here. Well, then it becomes the anode. So it's really important. You don't put something where you want it and you say that is the anode. The anode is only where oxidation occurs. So you need oxidation to occurring to, to call it an anode. Um, sort of one of those sort of mutually exclusive, inclusive things. Um, the other point is understanding your electrochemical series. What's really important about the electrochemical series is that it is at SLC. Um, and as you can see here, we have increasing oxidant strength and increasing reductant strength. So oxidant strength goes up, reductant strength goes down. We always use the strongest reductant and the strongest oxidant, really important. They always, that's what will react. So as you can see here, um, uh, so you see the following reaction will be able to be used in a galvanic cell. What if we replace the Cu2 plus with Mg2 plus? Well, no, it's not going to work. Why is it not going to work? Because if I use Mg2 plus, we have bottom left, top right. It's not spontaneous. This would have to be electrolysis, but we're not working with electrolysis right now. We're just working with galvanic. Um, the other thing as well with electrochemical series is that um, you're always going to work with the strongest oxidant and reductant. As you can see here, these two are going to react, not these two. These two are not, the top two are not going to be the reactants, uh, the ones that are reacting or doing their um, redox thing. Essentially, you're going to have the strongest oxidant and the strongest reductant being the things that go through redox. Um, so also what's really important is that um, the electrochemical series is at SLC. So if you're not at SLC, you cannot use electrochemical series. Now, this has actually come up in an exam before where they gave you a question that was not at SLC and they expected you to use the electrochemical series. Um, students that commented that um, the electrochemical series could not be used because of not being at SLC actually got marks as much as those who did it with the electrochemical series. So important, um, if this was to occur, it won't. Still do the question. Please don't write down like, oh, it's not an SLC, I can't do it. Just still do the question. But do mention that, um, I would just mention, write down and say, look, I wish this needs to be at SLC, so therefore this question doesn't theoretically work or something like that. Um, very unlikely it will happen, but it has happened in the past. So um, uh, I'm not 100%, I, I thought they did, but I'm not 100% sure how the sort of marking went there, but I'm pretty sure they did give out marks. But um, one of those things. Now, electrochemical series. Um, also really important is to understand sort of E, um, the E naught values. So if you have the E naught of the cell and you have the oxidant, take the reductant. 
you get these values. Um, it's always going to have to be positive the E in order of a cell. So just another point. Then moving on, we have fuel cells. Um, so fuel cells are sort of galvanic cells that um, are a specific form of galvanic cell. Why are they specific? Because they require um, a consistent supply of fuel. Whereas like in a galvanic cell, you kind of just put the fuel in there and you just leave it there and it kind of does its thing. Um, or you put whatever you're putting in there. In a fuel cell, you have to have a constant supply of fuel. Um, they don't run out. They just have to keep having this supply given to them. Um, what's really important about fuel cells is that they have an extremely good um, conversion of fuel to sort of electricity or uh, our conversion rate. So essentially, if you think about it, when you have a fuel and you combust it, you actually lose a lot of energy in that combustion process. I'm sure you've all learned about this before, but it's a terrible process. You get like 20 or 30% of your energy actually go into what you need. Fuel cells are somewhere around 99%. You get most of the energy of the chemical energy converted into the energy of the form that you want, which is electrical energy. However, the reason that we don't use them is because there are a couple of issues. So they're fiddly, um, they're quite an expensive piece of technology to produce and then to maintain. Um, and a lot of the time, the best fuel cells work with hydrogen. And then we talk about the issues with hydrogen. So hydrogen is a highly flammable, highly explosive um, molecule that needs to be stored at high pressures and is quite expensive to store because it needs to be stored in quite expensive sort of containers and tanks. Therefore, um, it's just not a practical thing to be used unless, you know, you're working for like Elon Musk or someone who has a lot of money like NASA. Um, so when we talk about fuel cells, they're really practical in terms of conversion, but they're really impractical in terms of their just general practicality other than the conversion. Everything outside of the conversion, fuel cells are not that useful. Um, so as you can see here, this is a fuel cell. They work a little bit different. They have electrolyte rather than a salt bridge. Um, and you can see that they're sort of, they're kind of in contact with each other um, because we need things to move across sort of the salt bridge like the H plus ions here. Um, I really like GIFs of fuel cells. They kind of make things really simplified. So if you're looking at a fuel cell and you don't know what's going on, search up a GIF of that fuel cell and it will simplify everything that's going on as you can see here. Um, and it actually makes er everything super more straightforward. Like it just, it just makes sense. Everything sort of makes a lot more sense when you look at it this way. Um, and that's how a fuel cell works. Um, so as you can see here, um, the main difference is they need a continuous supply. Um, there's a few other subtle differences, but you really just need to know that they need a continuous supply of reactants. So now moving on, we have electrolytic cells. So here's a little quick summary before we jump in. So electrolytic cells are really important because essentially what happened before is we went spontaneous. We went like this. Essentially what's actually happening now is we're doing the opposite. We're going non-spontaneous. We're actually going to go from um, bottom left to top right. So in this case here, we may have actually had, we may have had this again, but in this case, we may have had Zn2+. plus. In this case here, these two react. Now what's really important is what if I also had, and I'll do this in orange, I also had this and I also had this, as well as the other two. Well, this isn't gonna react, this isn't going to react, and this isn't going to react. Why is that? It's because we're always gonna work with the strongest oxidant and the strongest reductant still. So if I look at it like this, this is the strongest oxidant, so strong, we'll go strong ox, and this is the strongest reductant. So it's really important that you work with the strongest oxidant and the strongest reductant. Um, so as you can see here, um, there's also the concept of molten cells, which is something that um, is important because we have water. So when we have water present, other things will react. So like the water will react. So as you can see here, water is up here, water's down here, but it needs to be in the presence of O2. So if it's not in the presence of O2, then it's not gonna work. Um, you also have water all the way down here. So essentially, 
if I have, in this case here, I have NaCl aqueous. If I have NaCl aqueous, I've got this and I have this. And I have this and this. Which of these is the strongest oxidant and which of these is the strongest reductant? Well, this is the strongest oxidant, so the SO, and this is the strongest reductant, so the SR. So I'm actually just gonna have water reacting with water. It's a waste of time. I, I don't need to do this. It's not gonna help me um, and it's useless. So essentially what's happening here is I've got water reacting with water. Now, what if I made it molten? Now, that, that means I heat this up to a really high temperature where all the water has sort of steamed away and now I've just got like a liquid form of NaCl. It's bubbling around, it's molten, it's really hot, but essentially there's no water in it. It's pure now. So in this case here, now that it's pure, I can say that I have this, I have this, and I don't have this or this. So essentially these now become the strongest oxidants and the strongest reductants. So that's one of the really, really important things about electrolytic cells is that you can also make them molten. Um, what's really important about electrolytic cells as well is that they're sort of backwards, they recharge. So um, in electrolytic cells, um, essentially we call this recharging, things kind of go the opposite. So I really like this diagram coming up here. You've got a galvanic cell here. So this is galvanic um, and then this is electrolytic. Um, so this is an electrolytic cell as a whole, but this is it in its galvanic phase and this is it in its secondary phase or its recharge phase. As you can see here, what's important is that this has always stayed negative. This has always stayed positive. However, this has now changed to the anode because oxidation is now occurring there. This has now changed to the cathode because there's now reduction occurring there. So as I said before, you can't put something and say, I want this just to be the anode. Well, as you can see here, it's the anode here, but back here, it's now the cathode. So you can't really control those side of things. What's also really important here is we try the battery goes. It's always something that kind of comes up in exams and something you just, you just need to know without it ever really being taught. Because during discharge or the galvanic phase, you see that this is um, the negative side, Therefore, the negative side of the battery is going to be on this side. So make sure the negative side of the battery is on the negative side um, and the positive side is on the positive side. It's just a, kind of like on the salt bridge, how your cations go to the positive side and your anions go to the negative side. Same sort of concept, but here we're on cathode and anode. Um, and hopefully that sort of simplifies things down. Now, we've gone a little bit over halfway through that um, session. But that is everything for redox. Now, that's not everything for redox in a sense because redox is massive. Redox electrochem and um, fuel cells is huge. That The topic is huge and it's definitely one of the more difficult topics. Um, so if you are struggling at any point in time with redox, I just suggest going into doing and doing exam questions because exam questions are as difficult as they come, but they also teach really good basic concepts. They always sort of break down to the basic concept. Even if you read through a question, you have no idea what you're doing, you have a go at it, you get it wrong, but then you go and look at the answers and you'll see in the answers, it always goes back to the basic concepts. It's really annoying, I agree, but it's just one of those things. It will always go back to the basic concepts, so it's worthwhile going and doing exams and having a look through them. But let's move on to um, our organic chemistry. Now, this one, this part of organic chemistry, I'm not going to spend too much time on. I'm sure you all know how to name molecules. You've been doing it since year 10. It's not a difficult concept. What's really important though, is one thing that I've highlighted here is this IUPAC. Why have I highlighted that? Because it comes up all the time. They say, give the IUPAC name of this molecule. And students, a lot of students I find, I've never heard of that before, kind of go, they start sweating. They're like, what, what am I meant to do? I don't know what's going on. I'm gonna simplify this down for everyone. It's just the system it's the name of the system that we use to name molecules. So when we use meth, eth, prop, and we use the ain, ein, ein, we have the prefixes, the suffixes, all of that stuff, that is just this system. So there are multiple systems out there. This is the system that's more widely, it's the one that's really exclusively widely used. Um, and it's just the name of the system. Um, so essentially, if you see that name, don't worry. Essentially, it's just asking you to name the molecule as you've been taught. So as you can see here, butane, pentane, octuanine. Um, awesome. So 
there are some steps to going through it, but I'm sure you've all been through it before. But essentially, um, I like to think of it as like my sort of step process is count the number of um, count the number of carbons um, and then give a name to that part. So but, s, meth, whatever it is. Um, then I usually count um, to the nearest um, sort of subgroup or the um, sort of like a, a branching or a functional group or whatever it is then I start to sort of just put those things down. I just kind of go through in a systematic approach. Um, I don't have sort of this sort of um, stepwise way of doing it and doing it the same way every time. But if this is what you like to do, then go ahead. Um, and this is a good way of kind of going about it. Um, it's just not personally something that I, I kind of just go through it as I sort of see fit. So as you can see here, um, here are the different um, things you need to be able to name and draw. Now, what's really important? You don't need to know how to name a ketone. You don't need to know how to name an aldehyde. Um, why do I say that? With a little bit of a um, tone to it is because you kind of do need to know how to name them and kind of need to know how to, to understand them. Why I say that is because you'll never need to write this out. You'll never need to write propen one and this is meant to be one, sorry, I don't think it's meant to be an A in there. And you'll never need to write out propanol. But you may get given propanol in a question and you'll need to know what propanol is. So it's a little bit ridiculous, they say, you don't need to know how to name these, but at the same time, we'll give it to you in a question and if you don't know how to name them, you're not gonna know what this molecule is and therefore you're a little bit screwed. So you kind of do need to know how to name them. Just know that ketones end in one and um, aldehydes end in AL. So propanol, propan1, amazing. Um, the other ones that are less commonly asked for you to name is amine and amide, but I suggest to all my students that you just kind of know how to do it because it does come up in exams. So knowing an amide and an amine, they do come up in exams, so it's important that you understand how it works. Um, so go through a couple of things. So alcohols, What's really important about alcohols is knowing primary, secondary, tertiary. Um, essentially, it's the number of carbons that come off the carbon that has the alcohol. A little bit of a long way to, worded way of saying it, but this carbon here has the alcohol. This carbon only has one carbon buddy, primary. This carbon has the alcohol. This carbon has two carbon buddies. Therefore, it is secondary. This carbon has the alcohol, it has three carbon buddies. Having three carbon buddies makes it tertiary, so three prime. So primary, secondary, tertiary. That's how we go through that. As you can see there, this one actually does it for you. So I didn't even need to do it for you all. But as you can see here, it's done it for you via these little animations. Um, so then naming um, molecules with two different groups. I think I was just, I just wanted to get into the primary and secondary. Um, so this is the next most important part is that when we name molecules, we need to know our suffixes and our prefixes. Now, this is a really important slide. Um, if you take anything away today, I want you to take this slide away and know this slide really well. Why is this an important slide, you say? Because it has couple of important points. It has priority and it has the alternatives and it has like the, the prefixes and suffixes. So essentially, if you have a carboxylic acid group, you are always going to number from that carboxylic acid group. That is going to be the highest priority. If you have a hydroxyl group, NOL, but you don't have a carboxylic acid, you are going to number from that hydroxyl group. That'll be the, the highest priority there. If you have a halogen, unless you don't have anything else, your halogen is like, your halogen is always going to be the lowest priority unless there is nothing else. And therefore it will become the highest priority. So when I say a halogen, that's like a chlorine or a fluorine or a bromine or something added onto it. So as you can see here, these are the priorities of naming. Now we, as you can see here, um, we always give this name first. And then in this case here, let's just say 
we had a carboxylic acid with an alcohol somewhere else. So it was like, this is a weird molecule. I doubt you'd ever get something like this, but nonetheless, if you did, and then there was an alcohol over here, this would be one because it's the highest priority Two, three. So therefore this would be, this would be prop. So this would be prop anoic acid. I don't need to give it a number because it's always going to be number one. Um, a carboxylic acid, so don't worry about that. But I'm going to have to call it 3-hydroxy. Three 3-hydroxy three propanoic acid. So why have I given it 3-hydroxy? Because it's got an alcohol group and I can't give it ol because I've already given it um, oic acid on the end. So really important that you then go and give the, um, the next part at the end. At the start, sorry. So, a few examples here. I'm not going to go through them. They are on the slides. You can feel free to jump back in and have a go at these ones. But we've only got about 20 minutes left on this topic. So, we're going to fly through. Now, one other thing that I should point, though, is that um, uh, skeletal structures are becoming more and more common. Um, they do really like skeletal structures for some reason. They're just, they're just getting more common. Um, and... The way you work with skeletal structures, unless there is a letter, every end or corner is a carbon. So carbon, 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 carbon. Now, you can assume there is no um, functional groups here other than a double bond because of that double bond there. Now, I know none of you can respond because you're all at home, but I want you to take 10, 15 seconds. What is significant about this double bond? Um, it's part of organic that we're probably not, I don't think we're going through it today. I don't think I, no, I think they were edited out. I edited those out because, because of time. Um, what is significant about that double bond? What type of double bond is it? It is a double bond that looks like this with the carbon and then wait, it's got your functional group on the bottom end. So it's got things both coming off the bottom end of it, if you think of it like that. So this double bond is going to be a cis double bond because everything is going to be coming off the bottom of this um, of this one. So the, the hydrogens are going to be up here. And so therefore the chain coming off this way, oh well, you know, the, yeah, the chain coming off this way is going to be like that. Um, so therefore we have a cis bond. So if I look at this here, I don't know I can name this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So hept, it's got a double bond at the second position to en, and it's going to be cis. Now, one thing about this, my apologies. Apologies, my hay fever. Um, one thing about this is that cis um, is only going to be needed to ri be written, to be put with this, to be added to this if it's asked for. So as much as I've given it here and I made a big deal about it, I was just trying to remind you all and sort of refresh your memory on the cis trans side of things. But what's really important is that you don't need to add that in unless it's specifically asked for in a systematic name. Um, if the question is talking about cis and trans at some point, like in a different part of its of its big question, I would 100% put it in there. If it hasn't, don't worry about it. It's something they kind of need to explicitly ask for. But all I'm trying to get at is remember cis and trans, skeletal structures are way more common. So if you don't know skeletal structures well, make sure you go and practice them. Um, so as well as this, um, we're gonna look at the different reactions today. I think what's really important about reactions and I'm sure you've probably all gone and done it is do like a reaction pathway poster or like just like a A4 sheet with like your big reaction pathway on it. Um, I'm sure you've all gone ahead and done that at some point in time, but that's the best way to learn this content. Um, I don't think there's really any other way of learning this content well. Um, so just make sure you go ahead and, and have a go at doing something like that at some point in time. Um, so first of all, we have substitution reactions. It's where we take something off and put something on. It's pretty sort of straightforward, just swapping a molecule out. Um, as you can see here, great way of looking at a substitution reaction here. Um, so um, 
there you go. Now, substitution reaction, the most common one is with chlorine. Um, you may be asked to use different varying other ones, um, but I also think this is missing something. Um, think that chlorine is the one that you should always commonly go to. Now, why is that? Because it's got really nice things to put on the arrow. It's got UV light and it's got heat. Um, and now it says UV light or heat. I think you need to do both, um, personally. I think UV light and heat. Now, a lot of schools will teach a degree. Um, I've heard some teach 300. I was taught 400. I don't think it matters in the context of thing, things. If you just want to write heat, if you want to write your temperature, feel free to do it. I always wrote 400. I, I'm assuming it never lost me a mark. Don't, don't know 100%. Um, but I just teach 400 or heat. Um, but a lot of schools teach 300. I think that's also acceptable. Just make sure you have them on there um, and make sure you have UV light on there. So essentially, as you can see here, you have a, an alkane, you add in your Cl2, you end up with one Cl2 on there, you end up with HCl as your byproduct. So really important, you also remember to put your byproduct there that you will have a byproduct. Off goes the byproduct, cool. Now what's really cool about this one is you can continue to keep doing it. It's really important you have to keep adding Cl2. You can't then go and take this and go and put that there. That doesn't work. You have to, you can't put the HCl in there. You have to continue to give Cl2s, um, but you can continue to pump this through and you will eventually get a molecule that looks like this. Um, not very useful, but each to their own. Um, and it's important to also understand that the UV and the heat um, sort of act as a catalyst. They allow it to occur in a sense. So. There we go. So that there is a substitution reaction. Um, also with substitution reactions is that um, you can create um, sort of an oxygen, uh, sorry, an, an alcohol. Now what's really important about alcohols is that VCAR particularly likes to create alcohols from already made haloalkanes. So it's not very common that you'll go from a molecule like this to a molecule like this. That's very uncommon. You will always go from something that looks like this to something that's like that. You need to really already be a halo alkane if you have any hope of creating an alcohol. So that's the first step. Then secondly, they really like to create amines. Um, and they like to like they really like to create amines. I always get amines and amides mixed up. I was about to say amide, I was like amine, and then I like blank. It's always an, it's an amine. An amide is the one that is in amino acids. That's how I kind of always remember it, but it always takes me a little bit to get it. But essentially, amines, as you can see here, NH2s or NH3s added on, um, these are generally always created from alcohols, again, in VCAR land. So this is how you're always gonna create it. So you have an alcohol and then you create an amine. Now, what's really important about this is that these have a catalyst and again, 400 degrees or heat. Um, again, this one is less common. It's extremely uncommon to come up in an exam, but it's something you may need to know. So please do try and remember it. Um, Al2O3 is one of those things that you just, you just have to put it to memory and you just have to remember it. Um, it's not very nice, but essentially, it just has to go in your memory bank. Um, now, addition reactions. So addition reactions are a little bit more fun. You have a double bond, they make more sense. They go from unsaturated to saturated, or they can go from unsaturated to sort of a halo alkane. It just makes sense. Um, essentially here you can see, you can add bromine. Now you can do a bromine test. Um, if you don't know what a bromine test is, it's really useful. It tests for unsaturated molecules. Um, if you haven't seen one before, um, it has come up in exams multiple times. I would put bromine test into YouTube and watch whatever video comes up. So unsaturated bromine test in YouTube and it'll show you really well what happens. It'll, it just teaches you what happens. Um, and I think it's one of those things again that gets I feel like gets neglected by a lot of schools, but it has come up in exams in the past. So um, if you don't know what a bromine test is, that is your homework after this today is to put that in there. It's very simple, you will learn it very quickly, uh, but um, it's just easier for people to do it, to watch it on YouTube, makes so much sense. Um, but essentially things go from brown to clear because bromine's brown and then when it's bonded on, it goes clear, um, just for context. 
Um, essentially, alkenes become alkanes and you have no sort of um, byproduct either, usually. Um, now, what's really cool about these as well is that um, you can actually just form an alkane. You just put hydrogens in there um, and just form just, what would that be? It'd be ethane. Um, but as you can see, um, that's kind of how that works. There are three main types of addition reactions, but I definitely don't have the slide. Um, but essentially, we have um, halogenation. Now, halogenation is as it sounds, you add a halo in, so you add in a halogen group, so that's halogenation, halogenation. You have hydration, what do we think we add with hydration? We add water, so this is adding a hydrogen group, so this could be like HCl or Cl2, it doesn't really matter, or like Br2 or HBr, it doesn't matter what you add, um, it just needs to add a halogen group in there. Hydration, you add water. So you're essentially going to make an alcohol out of it. You're going to like add an OH group in there. Now, this is less common. doesn't happen all that often. Um, and uh, as I said, you usually have to make a sort of halo, like a halogen first and then or halo alkane first and then make alcohol from it. And the other one is um, hydrogenation. Hydrogenation. Um, I think I've spelled that wrong. Hydrogenation. I've definitely spelled that wrong, but it's hydrogenation. It's not hydrogenation. Uh, it's a bit of a weird word. But essentially, you're adding H2s in. You're making it a saturated molecule. Um, so it sort of makes sense. Hydro, and then this is like halo, and this is hydration. Hydration just makes sense. That's the three wordings. Um, and then oxidation. So oxidation is where um, we take our alcohols, um, and we make them into a carboxylic acid. Really important, you remember either one of these or one of these. Um, I always remember penanganate because I can't say it properly, so therefore that's the one I remember, MnO4 negative, um, and H plus ions added to it. Or you can remember dichromate, which is a lot easier to say if you really want to. Um, they are your catalysts. You just need to remember one of them. You don't need to remember both. Um, both. Um, you just need to remember one of them. Um, as you can see here, oxidation occurs slowly in the presence of O2, but you really need to be having these catalysts there for it to occur quickly. But essentially, you go primary alkanol to an aldo aldehyde to a carboxylic acid. If it's a secondary alkanol, it'll just go to a ketone, can't go to a carboxylic acid. Um, tertiary alcohols don't go through anything. So as you can see here, we have a primary, which it goes to an aldehyde and then a carboxylic acid. Really commonly in exams, they won't get you to draw this out. So what you'll find in exam questions, as I'm kind of showing here, um, but I haven't shown it like a full one, they'll give you boxes to put things in. So they'll give you like a big box, or they'll give you a little box, but they give you boxes. And notice how in this one here, you go from an alcohol to a compound, and then that compound reacts with another alcohol to create with H2SO2 another compound. So what do we think this is? We think this is an ester. This makes sense. Um, so if this is an ester, well, then this has to be a carboxylic acid. So therefore, there is no aldehyde step. They've skipped the aldehyde step. And that happens super commonly. You've just got to get used to that. It's something that if you dislike it, you've just got to move on and get over it. Um, but it's important to understand that they may put it in there or they may not. You've just got to interpret what the question is asking you. In this one here, they got rid of it. They didn't ask for it. So... Um, just important that you make sure you look at that. Um, but nonetheless, that's just one of those things. Um, as you can see there, that's what you get. And then lastly, um, esterification or forming an ester. You have a primary alcohol with a, um, a carboxylic acid and it yields an ester, as you can see there. And that's the molecule that we get. Um, so this is an ester bond within here. Really important that if you're breaking this up, this is the alcohol, so this oxygen belongs to the alcohol. This double bonded oxygen belongs to the um, carboxylic acid. Also really important when naming it, the alcohol goes with the ill and the carboxylic acid goes with the oate. So really important. Um, also another important thing is that you need to have a... Um, a catalyst of H2SO4 liquid, or you need to say 
concentrated, you you put the aqueous still here, it still needs the aqueous, but you have to write concentrated. I don't personally do that because I think that's just over the top. I just do the liquid, just better with the liquid. So yeah, um, so as it says, avoid writing this, but you, you need it there if you're gonna put concentrated. It's a bit of a messy one, that's why I just do the liquid. It's so much simpler, just do liquid. Um, so essentially, that is reaction pathways. As you can see here, they like to ask reaction pathways in exams. It's just how they kind of go about it. As you can see here, it's kind of how it works. Now, um, just quickly, I'm not gonna go through all of these slides in super detail. I'm just gonna fly through, I'm not even really gonna go through them. Um, I think what's just really important about spectroscopy and, analy um, and analytics is not getting stuck up on how difficult each individual task is. Look at it as a whole. So they're giving you lots and lots of information in these questions. If you are really good at math spec, but really bad at um, IR spec, and there's an IR spec question before a math spec question, go to the math spec first. It may make your life easier to go to the math spec first, look at the information that's in there, and then take that information, go back to the IR spec, and it'll help you answer the IR spec. Yes, you're not gonna directly quote the information from the math spec in that IR spec part of the question, but you're, you've got in the back of your mind, it's going to help you answer what's up above. Um, so really important that you go about these questions in an approach that makes it easiest for you. If you're really, really good at NMR, go to the NMR first. Like if that's what you're really good at, go to it because NMR is going to give you the most information. So essentially with these questions, you need to make sure that you, you go through each technique, you apply every single technique you have to all of the sort of information that you have. So get all that information, apply it to the one that you have, and then um, go through it from there. So really important, you include all the information, don't ignore anything. Even if you struggle at something, just look at it last, just don't ignore it. Um, as you can see here, mass spec, I'm sure you're all over it. Um, that's kind of what they look like. Remember what your base peak is and what your parent peak is. Um, I ask spec, remember that the sort of the fingerprint region is useless. Don't worry about it. It's below 1500, but then look at all the other peaks. Make sure you know how to describe peaks. Are they broad? Are they, are they narrow? Are they really strong or are they kind of weak? Um, and are they sharp or what are they? So make sure you know how to describe them. Um, make sure you know what, how to look at those in the data booklet as well. Um, and then NMR, I'm not going to go through NMR in a lot of detail, but remember, how, know how to um, distinguish sort of HNMR from CNMR, look at the scale, HNMR versus CNMR, which will be really, really big. Um, so just make sure that you look at the scale um, and how that sort of works. Remember, know you're splitting your plus ones. Um, I haven't given a lot of information here, purely on the basis that um, don't really have time to go over it. I just wanted to put in a couple of points there just to, just to talk about particularly how you go through it. And what's even better than that, is that in the next part, we're gonna go through spectroscopy problem solving and how to problem solve with spectroscopy. So that's what we're gonna go through after our quick break in question time. So um, once again, um, questions, questions, questions. We're gonna go through these for a couple of minutes and then we will um, go over this. So what does having a cloud point mean? Okay, so cloud point's a really interesting one and students always really struggle with it. So I kind of simplify this down and I even simplify it down for myself. Um, simply, cloud point is where a molecule, where the, the liquid fuel, so let's just say the liquid fuel starts to form little solids. So little crystals, little, little crystals, little solids. So think of it like viscosity. So viscosity is where the fuel starts to thicken a cloud point is the next point onwards. It's like the next thing. It's where they start to form tiny little solids, little crystals. Little crystals are really dangerous to engines. They're not, you like they're gonna destroy engines. So if you have a fuel that starts to cloud point, it may destroy your engine. So cloud point is a bad thing. We don't want cloud point to be a thing. And, and they think of it as cloud point because it goes like the fuel starts to go cloudy with all these little crystals. So don't worry about that. Um, essentially cloud point is a bad thing. So which of the fuels is gonna cloud point earliest in cooler temperatures, like which is gonna have a higher temperature in those cool temperatures? Because if you think about it, um, if I'm in Antarctica and Antarctica is like negative 10 degrees and my biofuel um, cloud points at 15 degrees and my petrodiesel cloud points at 80, negative 80 degrees, 
these are all negatives, negative 80 degrees. Um, and this is my biodiesel, this is my petrodiesel. And I'm at negative 10 degrees. This is very close to this cloud point. This is gonna start to cloud up. Oh, you can't see all this. Ah, sorry. This is what I was writing. Sorry, you guys can't see this. I forgot that you can't see this. Um, this is gonna reload. Sorry, I just want this to come back up. No, ah, of course it's not. Apologies, no, I'll get that back up. But essentially, as you can see here, you've got negative 10, which is my cloud point, and then I have my negative 15, which is my biodiesel cloud point. Well, this is my, this is not my cloud point, this is my temperature at the moment, because I'm in Antarctica. And then this is my cloud point on my biodiesel, and then this is my cloud point on my petrodiesel. I'm gonna to wanna to use petrodiesel because I'm so close to this cloud point that this is probably gonna start clouding up. My biodiesel is gonna start clouding up, it's gonna start forming solids, it's gonna be dangerous for my engine, and therefore it's bad. So having a higher cloud point is a bad thing because cloud point is like forming a solid. So it's like viscosity. You don't wanna become viscous at a higher temperature. You want it to be at a very low temperature. Same thing um, as cloud point. So they're very similar concepts. Of course, this is now, bro, no, it's working now. Um, amazing. So hopefully that answers your question. If it doesn't, someone just re-ask it um, and vote it up again. Uh, how do you do a limiting reagent? Okay, so I'm gonna do this very briefly because this is a pretty broad topic, but essentially um, you're told that there is 50, uh, no, not 50 moles, let's just do moles. moles. We're told that we have, what equation can we do? What's a good equation? Let's go back to um, our ice tables because they had a good equation. Um, this equation here, they have, that's a terrible equation. Here we go. We have two NO plus Cl2 goes to two NOCl. Okay, so let's just say I put five I put five mole of this and I put two mole of this. Now, if I do a rice table and I look at this, I've got ice table. Um, so I have ice table and then at the end, I end up with, I don't know how much I end up with that, doesn't matter. Um, all I'm gonna say with this is that if I have five mole of this and I have two mole of this, if I started out and I said, um, all right, I have two moles of Cl2, I want you to use stoichiometry to find out how many moles of 2NO I have. How many moles of 2NO do I have when I do stoichiometry? Well, I'm gonna go two, and this is a constant of two, so I'm gonna multiply this by two. I have four moles. Now, if it was the other way around, I said I had five moles, so I have five moles, and I wanna go back to this Cl2, I would divide by two, and I would therefore get two and a half moles. Now. Which of these numbers is bigger? So this is bigger than that. Whereas this one here is smaller than this. So this one is not the limiting reagent. Why is this not the limiting reagent? Because I have lots of it. This is the limiting reagent because I don't have a lot of it. There's not enough of it to react all of this. I'm gonna have this left over. I'm gonna have this in excess. This is the limiting reagent because there's only two moles of it. Um, and being only two moles of it, I need a 2.5 to fully react this five, and therefore it is a limiting reagent, and only four moles of this is actually gonna react. And that's really, really important, that only four moles of this will actually react. You wouldn't actually use a nice table there, but nonetheless, that's what I'm just trying to explain. Hopefully that's a very quick and simple explainer of that. It's a much more complex topic than that, um, but essentially um, that's kind of, in a limited time in this situation, that's kind of how you go through it. If you're still worried about it, what I would do is I'd talk to your teacher, and if you're still worried after that, maybe go to like YouTube, look like Khan Academy or something like that. They're really good at talking about these things. Um, but essentially that's a very limited and quick approach to that. Um, do -do -do. All right, last question, then we'll take a break. What is the best way to memorize reagents required for specific reactions? So, Okay, the best way to memorize rea the reagents is to do lots of these questions. And it sounds backwards, but you just need to do lots and lots of these questions. So um, just continue to do um, pathway questions. Make a pathway sort of poster sort of thing where you have all the different pathways. You start with a molecule and you end up getting to like all of the endpoints. Like you get to an amide, 
you get to an amine, you get to um, an alcohol, you get to a carboxylic acid, you then get to an ester. Um, you may even get to a different type of halogen, something like that. So you, you kind of have it and you branch it off in multiple directions and you look at, and when you're doing that, you sort of write down all your reagents. Um, that's a good way of going about it. And then to consistently do these questions, do them every couple of days. Even, I'm not sure you're doing chemistry questions every day, but make sure you're doing um, reaction pathway questions every couple of days or every like two days, just to make sure that you're continually, like your mind is continually going over these reagents. So you know them more and more and more. Otherwise, there's no other real way of just memorizing them. It's just reality of chemistry 3, 4. Um, but essentially, that's what you need to know. Um, awesome. Um, all right. I will continue to answer these at the end. Um, I may not get through all of them, so make sure you upvote the questions that you really want um, to be answered. So make sure if there's questions that you really want to be answered, make sure you upvote them because I'm probably only get through like three, maybe four or five questions at the end and that'll just be whatever is at the top. Um, so otherwise break time. Um, we'll take another five minutes. Um, considering this is about to finish off at 11 22. Um, we'll come back at 11 27. That is all okay with everyone. So 11 27, we're going to come back and then we're going to go through exam advice. It's really only like 20 minutes of it. And then we'll have some exam. Um, then we'll have some uh, quick time for questions at the end. Um, otherwise, there's not a lot left. This is this last part is pretty quick. I mean, there's a lot of slides, but it's pretty quick. Um, it's really just exam advice, how to attack the exam, how to answer specific different questions, etc. cetera. Um, and there's a little promo after this as well. So go and have some lunch or whatever you can do in four and a half minutes. Um, and I'll see you in four and a half minutes.
Pornhub. All right. Let's get started. So, essentially, quick promo, a um, couple of things. So, essentially, what we're offering this week with these um, with these lectures is um, the opportunity to gain access to all of our sort of paid resources. So, obviously, with ATAR Notes, we do a lot of things for free, but we do have some paid resources. Um, and essentially, Ed Unlimited is one of our paid resources. Um, it's a monthly subscription, and essentially, you get access to all of the ATAR Notes books. You get access to all of the NEEP exams. Um, you can draw all over it, do all that sort of stuff um, online. Um, essentially, it's like a big online bookshop. And usually as a monthly fee, it's pretty cheap. Um, but essentially, at the moment, we're offering a 21-day free trial, which is pretty good considering you're not far off your exams. So you could essentially do this free trial um, and maybe even pay for one month or not even pay for anything at all. Um, you don't have to pay for anything with the free trial. You can cancel it before the end if you want. Um, and you get access to all of this stuff before the end. So I highly suggest if you haven't done it before, doing it um, and having a go at it, I highly suggest using my code as well. My um, my code is much better than anyone else's code. You will get uh, offered some other codes during the week, but this code is definitely the best. Um, so I would highly suggest having use of it. Um, and it may be useful right now over this next week, if you don't have a lot of practice exams available or you only have the VCAR ones, maybe over the next week, you do a lot of NEEP ones. So this one has all the NEEP exams um, they're all very good. Um, so maybe potentially this week, gaining access to this, doing a NEEP exam, um, and, and it has the solutions, you can draw all over it, do all that sort of stuff. So I think it's a really good opportunity, um, and I think you should all really utilize it. Um, and then secondly, if you do like hard copy books, um, so you can read them online here, but if you do like them as a hard copy, at the moment they're 15% off. Um, We'll be doing a big ship out this week. So once these lectures are done, things like Thursday, all of these books will be going out. Um, and so they should get to you pretty quickly next week. Um, but essentially it's 15% off all these books at the moment if you are um, wanting a hard copy. So um, essentially, uh, I don't know why it's so low. Move up, much better. Um, exam advice. So. How is chemistry assessed? So as you can see here, we talked about it earlier with SACs. They're worth 40% of your unit, but 40% is adjusted massively when it comes to your exam. If your SACs are really easy and then you do really badly on your exam, your SACs come down. If your SACs are really hard and then you do really well on your exam, your SACs go up. So SACs are an interesting one. That 40% is an interesting mark because it gets adjusted by your exam. But in true sense, your exam is worth 60% of your mark. Um, and so it is a big portion of your mark. Um, it's really important that you do attend your exam, you do do your exam, and you do do your exam to the best of your ability. Um, so that's sort of the first point. Second point is understanding an exam. I'm sure you all know this by now. Um, there are 120 marks, 150 minutes. Um, it's like a minute 15 per mark, but please don't use that as your hard indicator. Why do I say that? Because some of the multiple choice questions should take you 20 seconds. Some of the multiple choice questions should take you three or four minutes. You will make time up in some questions and then other questions you will use more time up. The exam is is created in that sense. It's not created that every single question or every single mark is worth exactly a minute 15. That's not how it works. Um, so it's really important that you sort of adjust yourself to that accordingly. Um, there's lots of VCAR past papers back to 2002, although many of them are not relevant. I would probably only go back to 2012 maybe. You could probably go a little bit further than that, but 2012 is probably the latest you'll go back. Um, they are hard. Um, and the reality is chemistry exams are hard for a reason. They need to be hard because they need to split up students. So there'll be, there'll be easier questions to split up the students at the lower end and there's really hard questions to split up students at the upper end. Um, please don't worry if you find them ridiculously hard some of the questions, that's because they're there because they need to split up those students who are looking at 50s and 45s and so forth. Um, that's just kind of how that works. Um, so question types. So, I think what's really important now is I want to go through some question types. And this is one of the ones that is really important. We talked about it earlier today, is comparison. So VCAR expects comparisons. If they, as I said today with that question, they talked about advantage versus disadvantage, but they didn't explicitly say it in the question. That question just said, 
given advantage in comparison, pretty much, or they're given advantage of biodiesel um, over petrodiesel as petrodiesel is created from crude oil. So first of all, they've given you a hint that they want you to compare by giving you the two molecules. So therefore, you need to name both of those molecules in this question or in this answer. As you can see here, in this question here, with reference to chemical structure, compare the suitability of biodiesel and petrodiesel. So this one, they made it very obvious. They've put compare there. We even underlined it for you. As you can see here, we have biodiesels and their bonding. We have petrodiesels and we talk about their cloud point. Um, and we have petrodiesel, well, petrodiesel, and we talk about their bonding. We have petrodiesel. We talk about their cloud point. Biodiesel, cloud point. We talk about um, the suitability overall, and then we give an overall sort of distinction. So what's really important here is I know it's a bit of a, all a bit of a mess there, but essentially we have compared and contrasted. We've mentioned both explicitly and we've mentioned aspects of both explicitly. And it's something you need to do in an exam is you need to mention both explicitly um, when you are comparing and contrasting. So that's a really common one. Secondly, MCQ technique. Um, I think MCQ technique is one of the things that students don't put enough time and effort into. Um, I think the best method here is to do elimination, but that is only really useful when it's a worded answer. So elimination is you read through each response. You don't just go, oh, I think C is the best response. I've, I've, I've done like a quick quick glance over, I see C and I think C is, a, is the correct answer. No, I'm gonna go through A and I'm gonna be like, why is A wrong or right? This is why A is wrong. Rule it out. B, is B wrong or right? Why is it wrong or right? This because of this? All right, it's wrong. C, is it wrong or right? Well, I think it's right. And why is it right? Because this make this is correct there. Correct. I'm not going to underline. I'm not going to circle it yet. I'm going to go to D. Make sure I rule out D as well. I rule out D. All right, C is my answer. Now I circle it and I'm done. So it's really important that with those multiple choice questions, you really, really do sort of eliminate things. You read through them. Make sure you don't get tricked up. And the second thing is maths questions right all over your question. Right all over it don't be scared to put scribbles all over your workbook because with the multiple choice, they don't even look at your workbook for the multiple choice that you fill in a little like nap plan sheet for the multiple choice, but make sure you write all over it. Cause then if you have time at the end, you can go back and check that you did everything right. So make sure you write down all of your steps that you go through in a multiple choice question. If it's a maths question, as you can see here, all the steps were put down. They're pretty explicit. Although this isn't probably the neatest, that's okay, you're in an exam. You're going to rush a little bit. It's not going to be overly neat. Make sure you keep things in a, syst a systematic way and you keep your approach all on that right sort of technique. So I just think it's a really, really important that you keep to this sort of way of going about things um, and you, ease, you write and write and write. So here is a question here that I would suggest the best way to go about this is through sort of going through an elimination approach, but first of all, looking at the question and, and having a look at the question, like the, the sort of the context of the question before actually looking at the responses. So it says here, a fuel cell can be constructed that uses the following two half reactions. So we have this and we have this. What does this tell me? It tells me this is higher on the E and naught table. So this should actually be above this. So therefore my two equations I'm gonna to add together are O2, plus four H plus plus four E minus goes to two H two O. I'm actually gonna add the opposite. I'm gonna add CH three OH plus H two O goes to CO two plus six H plus plus six E minus. Now, important, I need to get these to a level where I can actually add them together. So what I'm gonna do is I would have to multiply this one by, so this one would have to be multiplied by three and this one would have to be multiplied by two. Now, I'm not gonna do that yet because I don't know if it's relevant for my question, but that's what I've done so far. It says, which of the following would occur at the negative electrode of the cell? Well, as we look here, the negative electrode is the anode because it's not happy, so it's not gonna be the cathode, so it's the anode. Um, and it's generating electricity as well. So it's at the anode and the anode is oxidation. I don't know why I put a Q there. Please don't worry, that's meant to be an O. Oxidation and oxidation involves uh, loss. 
So loss of electrons, the electrons should be on the right side. So this is oxidation here. This is my oxidation equation. Therefore, it says at my negative electrode, what is happening? Am I producing H pluses? Well, it looks like I am. There are H pluses being produced here. So I'm going to keep that one as an answer. Formation of H2. Well, H2 is actually being used up. So it's not H2. C, consumption of CO2. Well, CO2 is actually being produced. So no. And then reduction of CH3OH. Well, this is actually being oxidized. It is the reductant, but it is actually being oxidized. I'm left with A. So I made sure to rule all my other ones out and I went through it in a systematic way. And I realized I didn't even need to do this. If I wanted to create my whole equation, I could have done that, but I reached a point where I felt comfortable with my knowledge of the context of the question and I went into the actual question. So that's how you kind of go about that there. Now, spectroscopy problem solving. This is another one that commonly comes up. So individual spectroscopy techniques can um, only provide sort of limited information. So it's important that you kind of add everything together. It's kind of like you put everything together like a chemist. Um, and it's really important that you combine different aspects and you get the things you want from them. So you should be getting the molecular weight and limited parts of the structure. If you don't get anything for parts of the structure, don't worry. But for the mass spec, at a minimum, molecular weight. Infrared, you should be getting a functional group from that, at least one. Should be at least one functional group coming for it, or the information that there are no functional groups, either either. NMR, you should be getting the connectivity of atoms in the compound. I think environments are the thing you want to be getting here. You should be getting environments because it allows you to sort of figure out how many carbon environments are there, how many hydrogen environments are there. All right, so if there's this many carbons, there has to be da-da-da. Figure it out from there. So um, first of all, how do you actually tackle these? So I think taking a systematic approach if you really struggle is a good way of doing it. So here's sort of a systematic approach for you. So one, identify non-spectral information. What that means is, is there a molecular formula given? Is there a particular formula given in general? Like, is there one at all given? Um, what do we know about the molecule? Does it mix with water? Is it polar? They'll give you a little context. What does it tell you? Um, this information we, um, can tell you what to expect before you even look at the specter. So it's really, really, really important you read through the question and you identify the relevant piece of information or pieces of information about your molecule. Two, mass spec. Go to mass spec first. So if you struggle with everything, go to mass spec first. It's definitely the easiest. You get your molar mass out of it. Um, and if you're given an empirical formula, you'll know what your, your real formula is um, straight away. IR spec, go here next. I find IR spec the most useless for me but some people really love it. Um, you'll find functional groups here. You should at least find one functional group. It's really important that you do that. So as you can say, at this point, I know my alcohol has a molar mass of 42, or 46. So now, before you even go to your NMR, you could start writing down different alcohols with a molar mass of 46. But essentially, you go to your NMR. What's really important is that hydrogen NMR tells you about the molecule. It's most useful. I just use CNMR for the number of carbon environments and that's about it. There's nothing else you can really get out of a carbon, um, out of a CNMR question. Um, and why do you look at the NMR last? Because it's definitely the hardest. Um, for me, it's I like as much as I found IR useless, um, NMR was just the hardest. It takes the most time. So you can already have a heap of information from the first two and makes this one a lot quicker. Um, and it also kind of removes all the ambiguity ambiguity about it so the ambiguous nature of it um, I can never say the ambiguity or however you say it but ambiguous is essentially what it's talking about so as you can see here this is a, a question adapted from the 2017 uh, 2013 VCAR but essentially what you've got is a sample of a species X was analyzed using mass spec IR spec and NMR um, and they're all produced the seat the sample is heated in the presence of H MNO4 what does that tell me it's trying they're trying to oxidize it they're trying to produce a carboxylic acid for an extended period of time. It was analyzed again. It was found the new spectra produced were the same as the original spectra. This is not an alcohol. Unless it is a tertiary alcohol. Oh, ETOH means alcohol, by the way. Um, that's just a, that's a medical acronym. Um, so they're shown below, identify species X. So what do we know about species X already? 
Um, well, we know that it stayed the same heating in these conditions. It was not oxidized. It tells us VZX is not a primary or secondary alcohol or an aldehyde. It's probably another piece of information I should have put down there. So first piece, what is our molar mass here? Well, it's going to be all the way up here. It's going to be 88. I don't have molar mass. Cool. Done. Move on. Possible functional groups. Well, I have a very long one here, very long, sharp one. I'm going to say this is a carbonyl group. So I have a carbonyl group. This one up here is probably just reflecting my CHs. So not worry about that one up there. So I've got a carbonyl group and I've got an 88 gram per mole molecule. So what do I have? I have an ester or a ketone. That's what I think. I have an ester or a ketone. It's not a carboxylic acid because I didn't have an OH group up there. So what can we predict from these specters? Well, I have four carbon environments, so at least four carbons. Um, and I have a quartet, a triplet, um, and just a singlet there. So I have essentially a quartet and a triplet representing a CH2, CH3, and I have a singlet at around 2.0 that suggests maybe a CH3, C, double OH. And I have four carbon environments, so it would make sense if I had four carbons as well. So what if I put that together? It has a molar mass of 88, four carbon environments, three hydrogen environments, correct splitting, correct chemical shifts, that is my molecule there. So essentially that is how you go about that. So these are not easy and like that, that made it look way too easy. It's not that easy, but essentially just for time's sake, I've moved through that fairly quickly, but that's kind of a way that you go through it. And that's a really good example of how you go through those questions. Um, so hopefully that sort of answers that. So ethyl ethanoid. Um, now here's another one as well, experimental design. Um, notoriously, there's a four or eight marker, a four to eight marker near the end of the exam that usually follows a hot topic or experimental design. Some tips to the question are, plan it out before you write down your question. Really important, look at the marks allocated and allocate your key points accordingly. If there's fuels that, fuel choices in cold Antarctica and you've got four marks, talk about four things um, that are relevant to it. And there are my four marks. So I've before I've even started this question, I've already got my question, my answer planned out. So these big ones, you need to sometimes plan out your question. Um, don't be scared to spend more time on these questions. You'll make up the time in the multiple choice. And, and don't be scared to dot point out sentences or subheadings. If it asks for a hypothesis, an aim, a method, it asks you to actually produce an experiment, maybe. It might say, produce an experiment. Um, don't be scared to dot point out and say, hypothesis, this, aim, this, method, this. Like, don't be scared to do that. Um, Obviously a paragraph looks better. And if it's a question like the fuel choices in cold Antarctica, which is four or five marks, um, you're going to write that out as sort of a paragraph. Yes, you're going to sort of subtly leave a line in between each point or make sure you go to a new line to write your new point so that it kind of subtly makes it look like dot points without being dot points. It's still a paragraph. Make sure that in that case, you are sort of using paragraph. But if it's something like, like this, where you've got a hypothesis, you've got an aim, you've got a method, feel free to use dot points. Feel free to sort of subheading things out and make it look um, like nice, like that. Um, and then six quick tips. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on these, um, but we've already talked about this. Forget about your SACs. Um, I'm sure SACs are over for all of you, but use SACs as a learning tool now. The marks in them don't really matter. It's all about using them as a learning tool. Look at where you struggled in your SACs. Did I lose marks here? Did I lose marks there? Did I not do well here? Did I do really well here? There are the areas you need to improve. There are the areas you need to spend more time. So feel free to sort of forget your sacks to a degree. Just make sure you use just the sacks to kind of learn those little basic things you need to sort of go back over. Make sure you understand all the, con all the content. If you're doing exams and you're struggling in the same space every time, you're always struggling with redox or you're always struggling with equilibriums or you're always struggling with food chem, um, which we didn't go over today, but that was kind of the last topic for everyone. So that's why we didn't go over it. If you're always struggling with the same thing, always go back to it. Always jump back and go, all right, I'm struggling with this. I need to go back to it. Like you just keep going back to the same thing. So really important that if that's what's happening for you, you need to go back and you need to go um, back to that content and you need to make sure that you revise it. Um, and try and keep your exposure up to all the topics. Um, so if you, if overall you're plateauing and you're finding that you're getting mistakes in sort of lots of different places, make sure that you sort of go back to your content and you go, all right, I'm making a couple of mistakes here, a couple of mistakes there. Maybe I just need to briefly go over sort of more broad concepts and more of everything. Um, da -da -da. Awesome. Same sort of point. Um, I think this is just like another slide, just describing different points that um, 
are sort of similar to what we just talked about. Um, don't neglect revising and practicing experimental design. As you can see here, marks allocated to experimental design. 2013, it was two. 20, 2018, it was 16. Um, they love experimental design now. It's just one of those things that's trendy. It's been trendy for about six years, five years now, and they still find it trendy. Make sure you go, you're on top of it. Make sure you go all over your experimental design. Um, as you can see here, I don't know why I went three to four, um, but essentially there's an increased focus by VCAR, as you can see, same thing. I don't know why, I think I might've put in the same dot point twice. Whoops, please don't worry about that. Um, Practice exams uh, make perfect. VCAR is the gold standard. Um, apart from obviously ATAR notes exams and NEEP exams, they're definitely the ones that I have to promote and I will promote. Um, I think they're pretty good. Um, like I generally think they're pretty good exams. Um, but VCAR are the gold standard. Really important, the VCAR 2021 and the VCAR 2019. Now I've excluded 2020 for a reason. Those two exams should not be done until one to two weeks out from your exam. They should be the last two exams you do before your real exam. If you've already done them, that's okay. Um, if you are going to do them in class at a different, different time, that's okay as well. But if you haven't done them yet and you have no plans to do them sort of in class or in another setting, wait. Those exams should be done a week or two out. Um, why is that? Because they are your gold, they are the goldest of gold standard. The last year's one is the goldest of gold standard. The 2019 is the next best. Why have I excluded 2020? Because 2020, they changed the study design slightly. They removed some stuff. Still a very good exam. And everything in that exam is relevant to you. However, there is less content in that exam because they cut content out. So there's big gaps in that exam where there's content that won't be questioned because they just cut it out because of COVID. So really important. Um, and how many exams do you do? That's a completely individualized question. Um, it's not a question I can answer. It's not a question your teacher can answer or your best friend can answer. It's a question only you can answer. How much do you value exams? How much do you learn out of them? That's how you're going to learn from them. Um, and make your practice exams count. Um, how you approach each practice exam is way more important than how you do. Um, you could do 100 practice exams. If you don't mark them, it would be a waste of time. Um, so how to make practice exams count. You need to make sure you do them. You need to make sure you correct them yourself and you need to make sure that you um, actually learn something from. So if you're making mistakes and you go through and you're like, oh, look, I made a mistake here. Like I need to go back over that. Um, one of the things as well is use reading time in practice exams. Practice your reading time technique, what you do. For myself, what I did, I would read. So I struggled with Redox slash Electrochem, um, like that sort of stuff. So I would go back and read that. Um, so that's the first, no, that's the first thing I'd do. I'd go through and I'd read that question. I then would go and find if there was a big experimental design or a big seven, eight marker, I would read that. I would then go back to my multiple choice and start doing multiple choice because you can do the, um, the sort of not the non math ones cause you can't use your calculator, but you can do the other ones in your head and you can remember, right? C like question two was a question three was, was C question. And I think I got through like five questions or so in my actual reading time in my exam. So I was already five marks down. Um, if I got them right, I got them right. If I didn't, I didn't. But I was already five marks down out of 120. So I was down to 115 marks. So if you think about your minute per mark, that's, you've increased your time. I know it's not the best way of thinking about it, but if that's how you like to think about it, you've already increased your time. So kind of an important sort of aspect that I went through and that's how I kind of approach things. Um, replicate exam clinicians as closely as possible. Don't have distractions, put your phone away, do an exam like you would normally. Um, and yes, all those sort of normal things. Um, and choose curve carefully when you do them. Don't do them really late at night or really early in the morning when you're not you're not like going to learn. Make sure you have ate, make sure you've slept, make sure you've kept your routine and then you go about your exam in a way that you normally would. So a routine is a really important thing as well. Coming into exam season, you need to have a routine, stick to your routine. If that includes sport, if that includes um, whatever you do, if that's taking half an hour out of your day to go for a walk, read a book, um, play a game, whatever it is. If you need that time, make sure you allocate that time to your schedule. Make sure you don't take that time away um, because it's really important to keep on top of healthy other things, um, keep yourself healthy as like a whole, um, holistically, rather than just um, sort of running yourself into the ground with just exams. Um, now keep track, of your, keep track of your mistakes. So stoichiometry, um, titration here, it says there's a multiple choice question. I made, got that one wrong. Short answer, I got this one 
and this is why I got it wrong. Keeping track of mistakes is a really good way of going about things as well. Um, and that's about it. So we're going to go through some more questions. Um, but before we go through questions, while I'm answering your questions, if everyone could scan that one, um, and if it's possible, you could leave us a review. Um, obviously, five stars would be great. Um, but um, it's just a, a link to the ATAR notes sort of uh, Google uh, sort of review page. Um, totally up to you. Uh, but if you love today, definitely worth giving it a review. Um, but it's just something that uh, we're trying to get on top of at the moment. So definitely worth um, doing if you want to. So I'll leave that up for one more second while I eat. All right. So this one here, um, so I've kind of already answered this. It's also really interesting outside of obviously I use neap ones now being, um, I use Neap ones being at ATAR Notes and being at Shoot Smart. It's, it's the company we work with. Um, it's quite interesting because I don't actually see many other company exams now. And I finished year 12 in 2018. That's four years ago. Um, I don't actually remember what company exams I used back then. I do remember using ATAR Notes stuff. Um, and I definitely used the Neap stuff. So I can highly promote it. I think it's great. I think Neap exams are actually really good. Um, so definitely worth a shot. I don't, Otherwise, I don't have an answer for you because it's so long ago. Um, and now being a tutor, I kind of just do the VCAR ones every year and kind of go, all right, that's kind of what they changed and did, da-da-da. Um, how many practice exams did you do before your exam? So I talked about this as well. I don't think it's a quality question. It's a, I don't think it's a quantity question. It's a quality question. Um, I'm sure I did a few. I think I did at least all the way back to 2015. Uh, well, no. I did at least back to like 2011, but that was because I was in 2018. So I think I did like seven or eight VCAR ones minimum. Plus probably I think there was a Northern Hemisphere one and a practice one for one of the years. So there was two extras. I think now there's Northern Hemispheres ones nearly every year. So I would suggest at least doing probably seven or eight, maybe 10 VCAR ones, including the Northern Hemisphere ones. Um, but again, it's quality over quantity. Don't rush to get through lots of exams. It's not going to teach you loads. Um, what is the relationship between rate, reaction, and equilibrium? Because I have seen questions where the forward rate increases while the equilibrium. Okay, so essentially what I think what you're asking here is the equilibrium doesn't move. Um, this is a, it's, that's, this wording here is, this is a good question, but this wording here is wrong. The equilibrium doesn't move. Um, unless you are increasing temperature or reducing temperature, the equilibrium doesn't move. The equilibrium is always going to be where it is. I think what you're thinking here is that you're at a Q value. So you're, you're not at equilibrium yet. Your reaction is at a Q value of like 20 and you want to get to a value of um, 10. Let's say your Q value is 20 and the K value is 10. So you want to go from a Q value um, to a K value. So you want to go back down. You're going to need to increase your reactants and reduce your products. And therefore, you're going to see the rate of reaction go let's say the rate of reaction will go backwards. So you'll see the reaction go backwards. So the forward rate will increase and the, and the back rate is going to decrease. And eventually they are going to meet because the back, the, sorry, the, you're increasing. So what did I say? We're reducing Q to K. Therefore we're increasing the number of reactants. Therefore we're increasing the back reaction. So the back reaction, let's say this hand is a back reaction. It's actually sitting down here at a pace of, of this. Whereas the forward reaction is sitting up here. And essentially what we're doing is bringing it like this. We want to do it like this, or we have a sitting like this and we want to bring it like this. So essentially you want to get them into the same point. Um, that's where reaction rate talks with equilibrium. But um, this wording here is is not how I would is how I not how I would talk about it. I hope that sort of answers the question. I'm sure I'm probably just confused you more. But essentially, equilibrium doesn't move. The forward and back reactions will change accordingly to get the equation to equilibrium if it's not already there. Um, I think I've gone through this, the states of the catalysts. Um, the only ones you really need to know, the only state of the only catalyst that you really need to know is the, um, the H2SO4. It needs to be in a liquid or a concentrated aqueous. Otherwise, I don't think there's any other states of um, the catalyst you need to know because the H plus 
plus penanganate or dichromate, doesn't matter. You don't have a state on it. And the the other one, what's the other one? It's the AL2H3. I think that one does have a state. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, and uh, it doesn't have a state. I haven't put it in here. And if I haven't put a state in here, then I definitely didn't have it in my sort of notes. So um, I don't think you need to worry about the states on those ones. But good question. Um, da -da -da. All right, this doesn't want to work. Awesome. Um, doesn't matter if you write oxidation states as... Mm, no, I don't think that matters at all. I think as long as you just have um, 1 and plus or whatever you have or negative, doesn't really matter. That's a good question though. What did your daily schedule include in terms of concepts, revision, practice exams? Um, so interesting. So I only had four subjects in year 12. I did both of my math subjects in year 11. Um, so um, I had chemistry, physics, bio, and English in year 12. Um, my daily schedule when I didn't have school was sort of do at least one English essay a day. I started that from the first day of term three to term four holidays. Um, but that was just purely because English, I was terrible in English and I needed to improve. And that's the only way I did improve. Um, I had a great teacher who I could send most of my essays to and she'd go through them. Otherwise I'd go through them. Um, but essentially I did an essay a day and then otherwise I'd usually pick like one or two topics from a sub from each subject a day. So usually I do like, I do an English essay and then I do two subjects and I do one topic from each of those subjects, therefore giving me a rest from one of the, the subjects every day. Um, but it's very individualized. It's what you sort of value and what you get out of things. All right, last question. Um, what does the type of bonding in different fuels affect combustion levels? Could you, uh, I don't think the type of bonding affects combustion levels. I think what you're thinking is um, it affects like viscosity and so forth. Um, the type of bonding within fuels is like covalent bonds and those covalent, the more covalent bonds you have, the more energy it's going to release. That's what you're thinking of. That's just purely amount. Um, but otherwise the intermolecular bonds like dipole, dispersion, hydrogen, that depends on sort of viscosity and cloud point and so forth. All right. I'm going to leave it there. I apologies, apologies if I didn't get to your questions. Um, uh, easy. Otherwise, good luck for the year. Um, hopefully you'll all smash it out. There's not long left. Just think about those four months of, or three months or however long you've got a holiday straight afterwards. Um, Otherwise, go and enjoy the rest of your day and I will see you all around.